Thank you. Well, welcome members and officers to this meeting of the audit committee. Um, have we uh, any apologies for absence? No, no, no apologies have been received. No apologies for absence. Uh, so we move on to item two, disclosable pecuniary interest. I will read it as I am statutorily supposed uh, to do. Members are reminded that they must declare their disclosable pecuniary interest and other registrable or non-registrable interest in any matter being considered at the meeting as set out in Appendix B of the Members' Code of Conduct and consider if they should leave the room prior to the item being considered. Further advice can be sought from the monitoring officer in advance of the meeting. Are there any, just any members got any disclosable interest? There being no disclosable interest disclosed, we will now move on to the minutes of the previous meetings held on uh, well, the previous meeting held on the 24th of November, 1922. Uh, before we ask, I ask for matters arising. So perhaps 2022. What? You said 1922. <laughs> Did I really? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm of the last one. Who was born then? Pass the first test. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I disclaim in my... Uh, uh, error. Right. Thank you. Can we oh, oh dear. Can, can we agree the minutes as a correct record before we go on to matters arising? Proposed? No, I've got, um, sorry? I, I, no, I, no, I, there's something in the minutes which um, I'd like to bring up. Is, is it a correct the minutes? Um, or, or is it in matters arising? Is matters arising immediately after the minutes, or is that at the end of the whole meeting? <laughs> well, I'm trying to get uh, to see whether you could care that the meeting was correctly recorded. Oh, all right. Um, no, let let me, raise it now, Simon. Yeah, let me let raise it. If, if I could raise it now, because it, it, it's... Very good. I have no problem with what's actually there. It's what's missing. So I don't quite know where that fits. We discussed... Um, the, right, the, carry on. If then. I may. Uh, because it, 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 it I, don't want, I don't want to labour it. We discussed the dog warden last time, and I think the time before that actually. Uh, and it's not the comments which I, I think um, uh, Rosemary backed up. They're not in the minutes, so I, I feel they should have been. Um, otherwise, there's not a lot of point in us actually bringing up these issues. Um, and. <laughs> I, I will concur that what's there is absolutely fine. It's the sin of omission uh, that I am concerned about. I mean, and I just feel that at some stage, maybe in any other business, maybe um, James could just give us a very brief update on that particular. I think it was a failed audit twice in a row, I think. So. Well, let, let us then ask our committee clerk if she has any. Uh, note about this from her previous minutes. And I, think I wasn't actually in attendance at the last meeting, but I know you raised that it wasn't in the minutes of those, but, but it actually was under matters arising. But yes, you're quite right, I have missed it out. Oh, okay. It, so I Sorry, no, it, it, it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we agree that <clears throat> it should have been in the minutes. Thank you for that. Since we've agreed it should be in the minutes, uh, let us agree the rest of the minutes as a correct record subject to that uh, matter being included. Shall we concur with that? Seconded. And now since it, <coughs> it's included in the minutes, we can deal with it as matters arising and James can answer <laughs> Simon's question. At which point I'll hand over to Katie because she's got the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, you were due to receive an update from the Dog Ward Ethics Committee, but I'd agreed outside of the meeting with Brian, it'd be delayed to the next one to provide the update. Uh, the officer who needs to give the update was off sick um, over Christmas, so haven't been able to effect the changes they needed. In the meantime, he's been keeping me up to date and providing me with updates to show the actions they're taking in that area, so I can see work is being done 
and the plan is they'll be coming to the next committee meeting to give you a, an update in person. Thank you. First line assurance. So are you able to record that all right so it's assured it's in the minutes yeah. when we go to the next meeting? Yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. Right. Uh, have members any matters arising from the minutes? Well, I have a couple of things that are arising from the minutes. And if I could take you to page three. Uh, um, uh, uh, halfway down the page, it says the concern was raised at the inability to leave telephone messages for officers using the current Wi Fi telephony. The head of automation and technology agreed to take this away and look into it and would report, and would report back. Have we had any anything uh, uh, arising from that, James? Has anything happened? Yeah, um, I can. I can read through um, an update from David Baker, the Head of Automation and Technology for Omity. Please. Um, thank you for a second. So, um, after investigating our current setup, it is possible for us to use the existing technology to enable voicemail for all officers that have external calling enabled. External calling is the ability to call outside the council. Not all, can, not all officers have external calling, and it is a decision taken by the individual service areas based on incurring call charges for the service or an requirement for the officer. For all those officers with external calling enabled voicemail, it's turned off by default. Um, moving forward, the suggestion is that it in, uh, it's turned on by default and officers can then try the reason if they want it turned off. So it can be dealt with and we can have that uh, those voice messages recorded. So uh, 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 are we, are we, is that going to take place? So that, that be, that's the recommendation that he's now taking forward to see um, if that can be, it, it's going to be a case by case basis, but that's going to be the default position. Okay. Right, well, we best to accept that, I think. Chairman? Yes. Uh, it was myself who raised, and I did see it in the minutes, but um, so the default is that the officer, if you ring that officer, it just goes blank, no message. The officer has to elect to receive. That's the uh, default situation at the moment. Can it not be changed? And so are we going to change it to default as on? Okay. And so well, well, then officers can... It is on. frustrating. I've used it and called it very officers and it rings once. And then goes on. It just goes blank. Okay. Uh, Rosemary. Thank you. Yeah. Just a thought that we, we have the facility through Skype to leave messages for officers directly at no cost to the authority, which is probably preferable. Perhaps not all councillors understand that, I don't know. Um, I've never thought about it. I can share, but it, um, we have got Skype at the moment, and um, for Skype's being turned off and to be decommissioned by Microsoft. Okay. Um, but then there's still Teams, there's still email, there's still there's sort of other yeah. methods, yes. Perhaps it's the case that we you know, make an effort to um, do some training or briefing on how we can use no cost um, yeah. facilities or no further cost facilities rather than incurring more phone costs. Yes, we could give that consideration for the next training session. For us. Yeah, what, what we do about yeah. the other members? Yeah, sorry, I meant, I meant widely across the council, yeah, not just for us. Well, perhaps uh, I can leave that to James to consider yeah, yeah, how absolutely. that would be done. Yeah. And then just below that paragraph, the external audit informed the committee that the outstanding recommendations in relation to IT still needed to be resolved and would be picked up with the head of automation and technology and would be reported back to the next meeting. Have you anything to say in your defence, Grant, on that? Um, or Mary? <laughs> um, not in defence in that sense. Um, it, what we were proposing to report back as part of the um, updated audit findings report, that's been slightly delayed, so it will come as part of the recommendations follow-up within the audit findings report. So it is in progress, um, and we're just awaiting the final, uh, as I understand, the final piece of information from IT. So you will, when we circulate that report, which will hopefully be in a couple of weeks' time, then you'll be able to see the, the, the follow-up to those recommendations there. Thank you. Okay. I have no other matters on the rising from the minutes. If members are no other matters. We shall move on.
No. Uh, are there any public questions? No public questions have been received. Are there any members' questions? No member questions have been received. Thank you. Um, we now, I'm now come to the main body of the meeting. And I w wish to bring forward items 13 followed by item 15. My reason for this is I have very great concerns uh, about both these forms. Uh, and I want to make sure they are discussed thoroughly rather than left till much later in the meeting when we may find that there are <clears throat> difficult questions of time pressing upon us. So because, in my view, they are two of the most important reports on the agenda, I'm going to take item 13 now, and then we will follow it by item 15, and then we will return to item 6 back to the uh, format of the agenda. So if you would all like to turn to item 13 on the agenda, I shall be grateful. Page 107 to 128. 107 to 128. And I will ask Katie, on my right, the responsible officer, to introduce this report. Katie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Internal Audit Performance Report for 22-23 should be on page 107 of your packs. And this report provides members with an update on the work undertaken by Internal Audit in the three months since the November Committee. 64% of the revised plan has been completed, which is below previous delivery records. At the same time last year, we were at 73%. Um, in this time, two good, three reasonable and two limited assurance opinions have been issued, and the seven final reports contained 85 recommendations, none of which were fundamental. Uh, the committee is asked to consider and endorse with appropriate comment the performance of internal audit against the 22-23 audit plan. If I take you to the main body of the report, you see at paragraph 8.1, um, there are minor revisions to the to the days and plan in terms of the work that we're completing. That's based on a risk assessment um, as the risks change throughout the year. Um, productivity has been impacted as audits are taking longer to complete due to capacity in some service areas and its ability to respond to requests for information. And we've raised those issues directly with Section 151 officer as they, um, they come. As previously reported, we've got external contractors delivering some of the internal audit plan this year, and they have been delayed in starting their work. And as such, those days are not reflected in the plan yet, <coughs> which can account for some of the um, below par delivery. Um, so we've received assurances from those contractors that the planned work will be completed by year end where the service areas engage with the audit process. Um, so as I mentioned, the performance is slightly below uh, previous delivery records. Paragraph 8.4 shows you a breakdown of where we are with the audit plan, showing the percentage of reports at final is 33% and five at draft, with 32% of the plan in progress and 30% still to start. Alongside the Shropshire Council work, we also have a number of external clients and those aren't reflected in that work. So we've also been delivering days um, to those. Key points to highlight at paragraph 8.6, this is a breakdown of the audits completed in, since the previous audit committee and with a breakdown of the assurance levels and the recommendations against each. And, and then if I you can also see later on in the report table two, the year to date summary of all the reports to date. Um, so in terms of di direction of travel, we're looking similar to where we were last year in terms of the assurance opinions, with roughly 60% being good or reasonable and 40% limited and unsatisfactory at this point in the year. Um, so table one shows your breakdown of the revised plan days and the percentage completed. Table two gives you the year to date picture of all the assurance levels awarded to the audits and their recommendations. And table three 
There's no unsatisfactory reports <laughs> issued in this period to bring to members' attention. We've had two limited. Um, one was confirm highways IT application and the CCTV management and monitoring arrangements. The control objectives listed there in table three are the ones that weren't achieved as part of that audit review. I'll pause there for members' questions. and. Right, so thank you, Katie, for that. Uh, if I explain to members my, my, why I am so concerned about this, uh, then members can come in with their own questions uh, and queries in relation to, to the report. If I take you to page 110, which paragraph 81, which starts on the previous page, and para 82, the visions of the plan are targeted to provide enough activity to inform an end of the year opinion. And then it goes on to say, and audits are taking longer to complete due to a lack of capacity in some service areas to accommodate an audit or respond to requests for information. And, and then in the next paragraph, it says, external contracts have been delayed in starting their work uh, and their work is not yet reflected in the audit days delivered. Now, I'm concerned that there may be some officers. You, you, you can appreciate that audits never a very popular activity for, for, for service officers because it, it takes time to answer audit questions and to uh, deal with uh, the audit. And if you're trying to deliver a service, uh, you feel that uh, perhaps audit is impacting on that. But audit, as we know, is a very important matter to uh, ensure that the correct governance of all the council's functions is taking place. And I, I, I would like to know or feel that some uh, impact is being made on officers who are pleading that they haven't got the capacity to answer audit questions or to deal with audit, uh, to ensure that there is a understanding and feeling throughout the council that audit matters. Uh, it says these issues have been raised directly with a section 151 officer. What assurance can you provide that, we, that our audit team, our audit officers, are getting the correct cooperation right across the service areas of the council? Or what should we do to ensure that there is a better recognition of the importance of the audit function? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. The, um, I think the points that you uh, you raise are well made. Uh, that, that is exactly the issue that we are facing uh, that has been reflected in the, uh, in the report. Um, with the, uh, the, the the capacity across the authority at the moment, um, with uh, a lot of the the work that was um, <coughs> within service areas that was that was delayed or, or put on hold due to um, uh, COVID, um, and the backlog that that's then created is that's then being worked through. Um, with the, the changes that have been made, you know, a number of uh, services have been impacted by new initiatives and new new areas of, uh, of work, new requirements that have been placed on them. Um, and then at the same time, um, along comes the uh, the internal audit team saying, and we have got our, our plan to work through. So we're, we're, we're trying to balance all of those uh, those issues together. Um, what's really important is that the, the audit plan has sufficient coverage um, across the board. Uh, across the, the, the organisation uh, to ensure that at the end of the year uh, an, an audit opinion can be provided. So that's the ultimate test of this. Is there sufficient work that's being done in the right areas, in the right scope, uh, in, in, a, you know, in, in a varied pieces of work that enable that overall to opinion to be provided? And then against that backdrop, consideration of the um, what the actual outcomes of the audit work that's been done so far. So, uh, if every audit that was completed, um, what was coming back was a, was a good or reasonable, 
that required a different consideration if all of the audits that are coming back were, were limited or, or um, unsatisfactory. Now, what we're seeing is um, that, that uh, there is quite an element um, that, that is still falling into that, um, that, that, that limited or unsatisfactory uh, element. So therefore, we are having to ensure that that plan gives us sufficient coverage. The, the, there is going to be pushback from services quite reasonably and quite rightly. Um, the way that we manage that is to, uh, to try and adjust and accommodate those requests, those quite reasonable requests, um, where possible. Um, but there comes a point where we then have to say, no, we can't accommodate it any further uh, and that the work will have to be undertaken. So it's a mix of that. And I think what the report's trying to flag is that that is a, a, a consideration. It's something that we have to work through. And there is a risk as part of that um, that, that there could be some work that would be completed in time. Now, what's been flagged with me is the issues. What's been flagged with me is um, the, 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 the potential and the risk associated with this and the conversations that I've had um, with, with um, uh, various uh, officers across the, uh, across the, um, uh, the organisation has been to, to just um, you know, justify and, 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 and um, kind of uh, recommit to the, the importance of ensuring that this work is completed. So, um, so the concerns are there. My view at the moment is we can still complete an audit plan by the end of the year that will give us sufficient coverage to ensure that we can form an audit opinion. Um, but there is a risk associated with that. But it's a matter of balance, you're saying, really? Absolutely. Yes, Nigel. You're very right to raise that. I've also got concerns throughout the report about the uh, the actual staffing level of audit and more importantly, the experience as more and more are leaving their experience to be replaced by trainees who need an awful lot of training. And then we've got contractors who are meant to be coming and filling the gaps and they're not starting. I actually am quite concerned, and I need reassurance, that the audit team is actually capable of doing all of um, it. We've, um, we've worked very hard to ensure that the, 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 the team is uh, an experienced team. Um, so uh, while it's quite a small team, and we do have um, some, some new individuals within that, and we do have uh, trainees working through that, um, what we are ensuring is that the experience auditors that we have are undertaking the, the work where the highest levels of, um, uh, right. of assurance are needed. Um, and uh, again, Katie and Barry will flag with me any issues they have around that. When we bring in um, the externals uh, to do some work, um, we specify within that that we want experienced auditors that have got um, experience in these particular areas. So we don't want a trainee coming in from, from those that is just going to kind of work through some, some areas. Um, and by having, the, the, there's, there's, there's an argument that goes two ways. If you had a fully full capacity um, audit team, for a start, you do need, um, you, you need to have that succession planning. So you do want people to be in at the start and people to be, yeah. you know, experience. so you, you, you want that mix. If you haven't got sufficient, um, you've got all those posts forward within the audit team. By bringing in externals, um, there's actually an advantage to that because you have a greater level of independence. They, they although they've got, they, they won't have experience um, necessarily of the organisation. Actually, that's an advantage as well uh, because they can come in with a completely you know, clean sheet and, and, and ask questions that perhaps uh, auditors that have been here for a while who have done the audit times before may not ask. It's a balance, but but there's, there's advantages and disadvantages both ways is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, so if you bring in some experienced externals um, then and actually focus those on some areas where perhaps a, a, a different insight would be helpful, we can get an advantage from that as well. So it's all about just trying to make sure all of those elements fit together. Um, Again, I'll go back to the point. If we had more people in the audit team, you could have a, a, a wider coverage. Uh, that would that would make the delivery of the audit opinion by the end of the year easier. Would it make it better? Not necessarily. It just means that it would be an easier job to, to get all that coverage from it. The second paragraph, uh, the paragraph eight two after that, James, says external contracts have been delayed in starting their work. 
you are referring to the fact that we need uh, external contractors to fill the gaps. But if they're delayed in starting their work, what is their reason for that? Okay. What reason do we accept for that? So, can share the, um, uh, so, so again, what we have, when we went out to the external uh, the externals, we, we specified some time that we expected that certain work would be done um, and certain audits would be completed. So, um, again, if we have those conversations with the service areas and they say, uh, actually, could we delay it for a few weeks because of A, B and C, that's different because internally we would then just say we'll bring some other work forward but with the externals they've only got a set piece it's a piece of work to be done so you can't necessarily bring forward some of that other work um because it was laid out so that's caused a delay what we're our expectation is though is that we still want that work to be delivered over the period so we're trying to push it back to the, the externals to ensure that they manage that at the end of the day they, they've got a contract to deliver x, x uh, numbers of work um, so we want that delivered over the over the period it means though at the time that this report's been produced there weren't any definite conclusions that could be pulled from that to be added into into this work at this point in time and is there any sign that the external contractors are getting down to doing the work we want them to Katie you're able to yeah I can um, yeah we have regular um, meetings with the external contractor and um, work is underway they've got that work in progress um, and they're they are assuring us that they will have it done by the year end. Oh. The other point I just wanted to respond to Council Bill Beyond was the challenges of recruiting auditors are not exclusive to us. You might have seen in the national press that external mm -hmm. audit having the same challenge. Um, what we're mindful of is yeah, we've had a large number of changes within the team. And whilst we've got vacant posts at the moment, we're not immediately planning to go out to recruit because of the capacity in the team. We're going to I can assure you the quality of the audits um, is still our prime concern and as part of the public sector internal audit standards. All of the work is required to be reviewed by a senior. So as James alluded to, it's all supervised by a senior auditor and it's reviewed to check that independence of the evidence to make sure that the conclusions the auditor are coming to are substantiated with evidence. So from my point of view, I'm happy that the quality is still there. It's just that they're taking longer than it would an experienced auditor and as James said that part of that succession planning is we need to bring on more auditors to to recruit because it is a national issue around finding skilled auditors. Thank you Katie. Uh, if I may make my final point before I throw the whole report or put the whole report to members to make their comments. Can I take you to page 116 and the top of page 117. The bottom, the bottom of page 116 reads, it is also important to note that the audit reviews for fundamental systems are yet to be completed, and there are some significant areas of risk in progress and in draft that may impact upon this. Now, my concern about this is obviously when will they be completed? But are there any significant areas of risk that need what we should call a member input, that need perhaps the chairman and my deputy chair, Simon, to raise these with, uh, uh, with the senior officers within the council, other than the, yourself, James, to stress that we are concerned that significant areas of risk uh, are, are, are not being adequately dealt with. Does it need what you might call a political, political with a small p, member input into this to give to ensure that uh, these matters are dealt with? Um, if I can chair, the uh, I, I think it, it, it never hurts to uh, to um, keep the profile of audit, audit committee, internal audit. Uh, at a high level across the organisation, so in, in a sense that would always be welcomed. Um, but um, Katie, are you, are you able just to just to confirm uh, which which of the areas this, this is talking about in terms of the significant areas that, that are yet to be completed? Yeah, we'd be looking at the key financial system. So you've got Ben and Cheryl here to give an update today on the a first line assurance on the purchase ledger and a later item agenda on payroll. 
Um, we've got some other audits in Ben's area that we are due to start um, before year end. So there's those key system areas yet to do. Um, but I think it's probably a rounded picture you'll get from, from Ben and Cheryl as to where they are with some of those control improvements and again from Sam later on the, the payroll side. Right. So uh, we, we shall be able to get, you feel confident you can get those significant areas of risk uh, dealt with in time to include when we wrap up. Yeah, I'm confident we've got Very we've cool. got the resources to do it and I'll work closely with Ben and Cheryl around the timing of those. Um, but I'm confident those can be done in time for the year end opinion. Right. So you don't need any member directing appointment in that? Uh, not at present, but any member support the support for that. If that changes, um, I'll come back to you. All right. Well, that's reassuring. Um, that, that's, those are my concerns, members, about the report. The report's now before you for your uh, comment. Roger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you're bringing this forward, I completely concur with and agree, and it's good. Uh, in various parts in the report, I picked up that there are staffing issues within the audit, not the uh, uh, capability, it's the capacity and the new officers that 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 are there. Uh, I also pick up, and I'm not sure whether it's audit or whatever, but there is a strategic and operational, and it's those two. Strategic is uh, uh, member operational is officers and there's a marrying of those two and it's uh, whether audit goes into either either of those i note the memo which went round to all councillors and became all public last week where it says there are now three categories or going to be three categories of employees those employees who will work in the shire hall those employees who will now be categorised as hybrid, work at home and in Shire Hall, and those who are categorised now will only work from home. And then we have the risk report coming in later, and I see there's a risk there about retention of staff. I think all those coupled together highlights the question that you raised, Chairman, about uh, concerns about the capacity of the organisation to deliver and be audited and reach all the, do all the things that it is supposed to be doing. And that's where audit comes in. Are we auditing just the financial ones or auditing the uh, delivery of the services that we should be offering to our residents? And I do have concerns at the service level that Chopshire Council offers to the residents and should be offering to the residents is uh, reducing due to capacity and other issues. So I'm not sure whether that's an audit issue or how we address that, uh, but it does give me concern reading the, reading the reports and hearing what is happening about the pressures on the organisation. Are we starting to fail? Is that, an audit? is that an audit or audit not? not? We, we, your, your comments are very relevant to audit. Um, the question of the impact on the functions of the wider council are beyond uh, uh, discussion here today. But if you'd like to have a response to Roger or, uh, on audit pressures, I shall be grateful. Yeah, I think um, I can change Kate may want to add to this, but um, I think that, you know, the points are well, uh, are well made. Um, there is a change in terms of the way in which the organisation is working, um, and that's been evolving over a, um, a few years now. Uh, and those those are uh, becoming embedded in the way that we in the way that we work. Um, I think in terms of the, um, the the fundamental point from internal audit is the is the the internal control environment. Um, and so the question that we're asking is not the quality of the services that are being provided. Uh, it's not the performance of those services. It's fundamentally about whether the, the internal control environment is strong and robust, but the strong governance arrangements around it. Um, so it, it. In a sense, whether or not 
that the, the performance of that particular service is good or not, that's a scrutiny consideration. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're looking for uh, is not to therefore review every single uh, service or review a single uh, area because that, that's not um, that's not appropriate and, and it's not deliverable. Um, but it's about making sure that we are looking at those areas that give us confidence that the control environment is working appropriately. And you can do that by looking in certain areas. So in terms of the point raised around um, the, the, the different approaches to, uh, to working, home working, hybrid working or, um, uh, or, or, or being uh, work-based, um, uh, based, the, 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 the audit opinion then would be considered around uh, the, the approach, the rules, the regulations, the, the, the way in which um, uh, the functions that need to be delivered are being delivered through that. So an audit of the financial system to ensure that the same controls are in place, whether you're working from home or whether you're working in Shire Hall, Shire Hall for example, would give confidence around that. It doesn't say anything about how that delivery happens. It just says it just works through that control environment. So I think that's the important distinction that we need to make. Um, and that's the bit where the, the, the plan uh, the, the audit plan will change over time as we um, uh, change the way in which the organisation uh, works. And is there anything you want to add to that, please? Um, I think James has covered the main points. So one thing I'd say around the capacity around responding to COVID and the constant change and additional work put on to the local authority does have an impact on the organisation's ability to respond. And there is a, almost a hangover effect of um, while stop activity was paused to respond to COVID, those service areas have to recover and it's, that work doesn't disappear. It's not like the hospitality industry that it's closed and there's nobody to serve. All those things are still waiting once responding to COVID has gone. In terms of the split of are we just looking at financial or are we looking at operational? Table two in the performance report, it gives you the breakdown of all the audit areas we look at, and it's a mix. To give that your end opinion, we do need to do the financial systems because of the materiality um, and the number of areas that touches on within the organisation. But there's also then a mix of those operational areas. There's then the IT environment to consider as well. And there's certain things that we have, like those grants that we have to audit and sign off um, for central government. So it's a mixture really and in terms of the categories of workers yeah we're in the internal order in the same um, boat we have a mixture of how we work and we use the technology to the best effect so it's a combination of if we need to we'll be in in person we can book desks and come in um, and we do that regularly as a team and um, through our team meetings and training if if that's the best way to do it um, but we're able to work effectively from home using the technology that's there and and with our customers as well that um, we you know we can have a meeting in person if need be but equally we can have that over over teams so the technology is there to enable us to work effectively either way um, and we'll respond to the clients however they need we have a mixture of external clients as well that prefer in person and if that's what they require we will but being mindful that sometimes remotely is the, best, the more effective way to work rather than, you know, the, there's also the environmental impact to consider travelling long distances between um, locations. So I say it's, it's a mixture, really, a blended approach of how we, how we do it. You'll see when we come on to Report 15, the internal audit plan for next year again, you've got an opportunity there to see the areas that are covered in the plan and those that we haven't got the resources to cover where you might want to seek a first line assurance from that service area if you've got... Um, concerns or you want to satisfy yourself that those controls are operating effectively. Thank you, Katie. You have touched upon a another concern that I haven't expressed today, but I'll express now, is that I am worried that those who we are auditing are using, still using COVID as an excuse for not responding as promptly as they should or with as completely as they should. To my mind, COVID effectively in terms of absenteeism, you know, people having to be off with COVID, has largely passed. How long are we going to accept as auditors uh, the backlog from COVID 
as a reason for not responding as well as we might hope uh, from those that we are auditing. In other words, what's your view about the ongoing effects of COVID? <coughs> is it realistic to still be people still be pleading COVID as a reason for not producing the information we want? I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to give a really blind answer. Uh, yeah, but, but, um, <laughs> in some cases, absolutely, and in some cases, no. Uh, it, yeah, um, but there there are some service areas that um, very quickly um, came. You know, moved from staff being seconded over to somewhere else to then back back to the day job, um, and the day job was then carried on because the bit in the middle had stopped. Um, with others, um, actually, the work that they were doing didn't stop, but they were also moved into other areas to help, and and that that work was parked. Uh, and so there are in in areas there are huge backlogs that people are working through, and this has been the case. How long? Yeah. You, you, we're getting to a point now where those things need to have been dealt with, um, but there are some examples in some areas where there is, there is still some some, um, uh, some some reasonableness around those uh, those points that were raised. But we're getting to the end of that. Next Good. Well, you're the best person, to, or you and Katie are best to be able to judge this. <clears throat> so there are not a view from outside the uh, organisation, shall we say, about outside the audit uh, work force as to whether there has been any obfuscation, so I would say, due to the product, but I really would love to accept your response to that. Thank you, yeah, on the same line. I just wonder, um, I, I totally understand what you said, Katie, and thanks for what you gave as well, James, on that, that um, there are services that have built up a huge backlog and I think I'm sure that you know which ones they are and I'm sure that they make sense, logical sense, restaurants closing, nothing's happening for a period and then they start again, that's a good example really. Obviously we don't have any of those but there are services that might be akin to that. But I just wonder can we, um, is there some way of changing perception of audit um, in our management staff because for me if I was trying to manage a service back out of that kind of backlog I'd see audit as one an inconvenience but also a potential tool to help me get back to where i need to get back to so i think audit perhaps needs a you know a, i don't know what's what's the word a I makeover, <laughs> a makeover <laughs> in that sense i don't know um that, that's one and then um i think it must be possible for us to obviously you know but can we correlate the lack of response and the sort of you know, lackluster responses coming back from service managers with the services that are understood to be in those kind of delays. It should be possible to see where it's used as an excuse and where there's a genuine backup, um, you know, a, a real reason for those delays. I also wondered, as far as capacity is concerned, do we correlate the lack of response where there really is a lack of capacity in the staff? Um, or do we, you know, is that just a general thing? Because in the same way that COVID is a convenient sort of post you can hang some um, inefficiencies or you know difficulties on excuses if you like so can capacity at the moment there are many areas um, of employment where capacity is not an issue double negative there but you know what I mean um, capacity is an issue right through but there must be areas of service where there's a clear um, capacity issue and are those the ones that are giving us um, report um, you know slowdowns to respond to that chair I think this um, I think the important thing to, to just kind of emphasise is um, it, it is all considered on a case by case basis. So there'll be a plan. That plan is agreed with um, the, the, the relevant um, executive director, assistant director, head service, so that there's clear expectation of what's required. Um, the auditor would then be would, would contact the team, the service at that point and say, uh, and if there was pushback against that, that, that's where the initial challenge would start. If the if the auditor then felt that, that was reasonable, they would still raise it with their manager. Their manager may then check that, push that, uh, you know, get some confirmation around that, or or actually push for no, that's that's not valid, and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, that then gets escalated through to the head board. It gets escalated through to me. So there were stages whereby, and as I said before, you know, I've had conversations with other executive directors, for example, and said. This is the reasons why this needs to happen. We need to find a way of doing this. And that's been 
that's and blocked it in some cases. In other cases, it's been pushed back with, well, no, because of A, B, and C, and, and that's been accepted. So they are considered on a case by case. So that that correlation, effectively talking about, we don't do that on a on a high level. We do it in terms of the um, uh, the, the kind of the individual requirements as, as they are. Um, and in terms of the the, the rebranding of internal audit. Yeah, if we could, if we could um, find a way for, for people to welcome uh, or the in. I think there is a... Uh, it's the we want to be loved, James. We want to be everybody loved. Everybody wants to be loved, don't they? Um, the, um, I think something around the, um, uh, the, the understanding of what audit is there to do. So it's not there to come in and find problems, to come in and sack people, to come in and, and you know, who's had the finger in the till. That, that's kind of a very old perception. Um, and certainly what I impress on all of my service areas are, um, so the payroll one is a perfect example. You know that the payroll um, system isn't working in the way that it needs to. Um, you know, the team are saying uh, that, that they've got concerns. The, the organisation as a whole is saying they've got concerns. What do we do? Why don't we bring internal audit in that can help clarify what some of those issues are? And just because sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees in these sorts of things. So understanding that, clarifying that, setting out, actually, these are the bits that are most important. These are the bits that are less important. These are the bits that maybe you're concerned about, but actually the risk associated with those is different. When you take that that um, in, independent view, it can add a lot of value. Um, and so I try and push that message. And who knows, eventually people will, will start to love their auditor. <laughs> Thank you, James. Well, I think James and Katie, and external audit have all got the understanding that the members are concerned about the uh, the cooperation for performance with the audit function by officers across the council and you can express the audit committee's views uh, if you wish to back up any uh, pressure that you feel you need to put. Simon. Yeah, I, I do think we need to be clear what um, internal audit's role actually is. It's not manual consultancy. I mean, it can have that effect and I would welcome that as you've just quite clearly explained, uh, James. Um, but I would not be comfortable um, and, and as being part of an audit committee, which would encourage um, the internal audit team to step back because it's too difficult to go in. I think your job is to make sure that the controls which this council has in place operationally are functioning. And it, it is worrying if you don't get cooperation. For me, that's a red flag to suggest that there is something which may not be quite right in a department. That is your job. You're not here to be loved. You're here to make sure that processes and procedures are followed. And that is what should give us a great deal of comfort that there isn't any malfeasance going on within the within the structure. So I really hope that I've counterbalanced a view which says just go and be loved because no, no. you shouldn't be doing you're in the wrong job in my, in my opinion. Well, having said that, I've got one very quick one. You're 64% um, of the challenge. Do you think you'll get to 100? Or are we going to be looking um, not, not not achieving what you, what you, have, what you set out to? 90 they're trying to achieve. Uh, yeah, 90 is our target. Obviously, I'd love to achieve 100. I think um, it's a challenge. And for us, it's very much dependent on can the external contractor deliver what they said okay. they're going to deliver. Um, in terms of our team, um, I'm confident they're delivering what they need to. Um, I've got oversight of their work um, every day. I take the point, yeah, um, as much as James says, we all want to be loved. We're, we are very aware of that relationship. So it's it's a mixture really that we need to work with the business to get the best out of them, but we are independent from it. And um, I can assure if there's an area where there's a feeling of, you know, no go, you can't go, I'd raise that with James. But I've got a number of avenues that I... Can go to, so I can go chief exec, can come to members. Ultimately, what I could do is come back and say, I cannot provide you with any assurance in that area because I can't engage in an audit. That's a position that I and the organisation don't want to be in. So we'd work with the business to get that audit completed. But ultimately, yeah, that's that's the end sanction. If I can't get an audit done, we say we can't provide assurance in that area. Thank you. That's quite good. Well, thank you for that, Simon. I think you should summarise the matter. 
very adequately. Chair, can I just quickly say, uh, my point was not to have the audit committee loved and the and the audit department loved. <laughs> Everybody uh, wants to be loved. That is maybe true, but that was not my point. My point was for managers in a sensible business way, business-like manner, to understand the value of audit in delivering their service. Thank you. Point well made. That's, I think that should be law concur with you. Pure. Thank you for letting me ask a quick question. Um, I see that we're aiming for 90%, but I wonder, is there a threshold at which it could then be escalated as a strategic risk on the risk register? That if we fall below, let's imagine as an organisation globally, we fell below 50% of the plan. It's not going to be achieved by the end of the year. That jeopardises the reputation of the council. Could we not agree a threshold where if we're not keeping up, you know, year to date, with a certain threshold that actually this committee places on the corporate strategic risk register that we're flagging this as a risk to the reputation of the whole council that's my first point the second point is i did used to work at another authority and departments that got the best audit got a reward so you can find a way to love audit <laughs> just a certificate to say well done <laughs> I think that's beyond us at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll leave a comment on the second uh, yeah. point if I can share. But, yeah, but certainly um, there, there is a point where it, it would become a strategic risk and, and it would be the risk around the, the, the internal control environment. Um, so we, we can certainly look at that and see whether there's a, there's a threshold that we would want to put. I think if I could respond, so, um, just to assure, I have regular meetings with James, the Section 151 officer, and um, Tim Collard, as well as, um, as monitoring officer around governance. If there were a point where I felt um, I was unable to deliver a year-end opinion or performance it did, my first port of call would be to raise them in that way. Um, just to assure you and Rosemary as well, into Barry and I are thinking as well of, of ways of promoting internal audit and changing the narrative around internal audit. I'd welcome a makeover. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's things we did. We've done things in the past around um, going, offering to go to team meetings to those service areas that aren't so aware of audit and the benefits and um, other things we do where we have positive engagement so I can't give them a lovely reward but it's difficult yeah. I do provide positive feedback to the assistant director or director in that area to say you know we've had a real positive experience even ones where the, uh, the assurance level maybe isn't um, what they'd want it to be but if we've had positive engagement um, I'd report that back to them as well so they get that recognition of the engagement they've provided. Thank you, Katie. Well, we've uh, gone substantially through and raised concerns about the audit performance uh, in the current year that we're in, 2022-23. So, before, shall we now note the performance of internal audit? I'm not prepared to uh, do anything further on that. And I, so I propose that we note the performance of internal audit to date in this financial year. Agreed? Thank you. So now let us look at the proposed performance of audit in the draft internal audit annual plan for item, item 15. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so thank you. The draft internal audit plan for 23-24 starts on page 133 of your packs. Um, it's the risk-based audit plan um, presented to audit committee for approval. Um, so it provides you with details of the annual plan coverage across the high risk areas of the council. And the committee is asked to consider and endorse with appropriate comments the approach to create the internal audit plan for 23-24 and approve its adoption. Um, I can take you into the main body of the report, paragraph 7.3. Brief description of the process we go through to create the audit plan. So it's a risk assessment that's reviewed annually. So we look at all areas of the council, which we call our audit universe, and we consult with the chief exec, executive directors, and also our assistant directors for feedback. Um, what we do then is um, part of our internal audit process. We also risk assess as we go through doing other audits, which gives us a feel in that area of um, how the controls are operating. So this year, the challenge is the council is embarking on a significant period of change following the rollout of the Shropshire Plan. And they're continuing um, approach to see we've got to um, provide assurance against that. 
So we're proposing a similar approach to last year where we have a core plan and a call off list that gives us ability to respond in an agile way as things change. So if I take you then down to Appendix A, it gives you the breakdown of the plan for the year. And what that shows, there's a the available days for internal audit are 1,398 um, with 199 days for our external clients. As part of the risk assessment, if I were to look purely on a risk basis at high risk areas, we would need 3,753 days to deliver that. So there's a process I have to go through of matching our resources against the risks. And what you have in Appendix B is the high risk areas, according to our risk assessment, that we're not auditing this year. So they're areas that you might want to seek first line assurance on. Appendix C, what we call the de minimis areas, these are areas that are low risk that we wouldn't be intending to audit. So it's that transparency of giving you a breakdown of all the areas where if we had nearly 4,000 days, we would be auditing, but we've got to do it on a um, resource base as well. What I'm happy with is that that plan gives me enough coverage to provide a year of opinion, but responding to the level of change that's anticipated this year, we're looking at 64% of the plan being planned audits and 36% as unplanned. Whilst I say it's unplanned, I have a list of high risk areas, a call off list as such, so it's not um, just a bucket of days not to use. But what that enables me to do is not spend lots of time reorganising the plan, moving things in and out. As it gives me capacity to respond as the risks change throughout the year. Um, so just to highlight key points in paragraph 7.13, included in the planners, several key partnerships and fundamental systems, including the payroll system, which is of a high material value to the council's operations. We also perform a separate risk-based analysis of the IT audit areas, and that's been conducted. So within the plan, there's provision for IT audit. Um, we also have responsibility for counter fraud. So there's a contingency within there for approximately 50 days to respond to counter fraud. Um, we also request schools complete an annual self-assessment, uh, sorry, a three year rolling cycle of self-assessments. Um, and we use that then to inform which schools we, we would audit. So the head teachers are asked to share that self-assessment with their chair of finance and chair of governors, and they're responsible for signing it off. So we gather that information and analyse it as well, and that will give us um, a risk profile of which school areas we would audit. Again, to accommodate those new recruits, um, there's additional establishment audits with compliance testing built into this year's plan. Um, and that level of detail will also inform our counter fraud control environment. So it gives us um, additional information that we can use in a different way. Procurement, commissioning and contract management uh, continue to be priority areas as well. And those, there's planned initiatives in the audit plan for those. Um, and we also have a smaller unplanned contingency um, <laughs> where we can respond to any unforeseen activity at this point. Um, and also providing advice um, throughout the year as new projects come online. So the key points are Appendix A is the summary of the planned days to be delivered against each service area. <coughs> Appendix B is the breakdown of the high risk areas for which no provision is made in this year's internal audit plan. And Appendix C is the de minimis areas that um, by us consider to be low risk, but they're there for information for you if you need to seek other assurances. So I pause there for any questions. Thank you. Well, before I go to members for their questions, can I express my concerns uh, as to why I'm worried about this report? Um, if I return to page 137, power 7, 8, page 137, power 7, 8. Um, <clears throat> Two, two things arising here. Now, we're waiting uh, for a newly created head of policy and government post. When is this likely to be in place, James? When do we like to have this person in place? So, um, if I may share, we, Gary's uh, been gone quite a while. That's right, yeah. So, um, so um, when Gary uh, left 
uh, Barry and, and, and Katie set into uh, engine roles to ensure that was covered. Uh, and then that's been taken account of uh, in relation to some of the recruitment that's been undertaken. So we brought in uh, two experienced auditors uh, at the time we were looking to recruit one, which would help to um, uh, provide some more capacity around that. The head of policy and governance role um, has been um, advertised and is in the process of being recruited too. We're in the middle of the interview process um, at the moment. So some have been interviewed, some still to be interviewed. Um, and we would hope to conclude that in the next um, in the next week or so, um, at which point, if we're able to uh, to uh, recruit from that process, um, then we would be then working through notice periods. If we're unable to recruit from that process, then we would have to uh, go back out to the uh, to the market and, and try a different way uh, of recruiting. Um, but we're in that process at the moment, so I would expect um, uh, all things being equal. Um, to have somebody in place within the next few uh, few months. Next few months. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If we notice periods, we're talking that it could be three up, months. Could be up to three months notice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, three months. From when we lost our head of all, it is really it's been a long, long time. Um, and then the other point in this paragraph: several res there's been several resignations within the team. I can't believe that you're a big bully in force, you know, creating a, a climate of fear. I'm wondering just why we've had several resignations within the team. Are these, would you be happy, happy that these are, are natural resignations due to people getting better jobs elsewhere or taking uh, maternity leave or whatever? What's it, you know, in other words, what? Why have they had so many resignations? Several. Uh, there's a mixture, and obviously there's uh, several have come at once. So obviously with then um, Kerry leaving her post of, as head of audit um, was through retirement. At the same time, we had a principal auditor um, who moved still within the council. So it's a mixture. There's other moving for other jobs. Obviously working remotely opens up the number of opportunities um, for people to be able to take different roles. Um, as part of the council's normal process, we do conduct exit interviews to identify the reasons why um, why people are leaving, uh, and it's a mixture. I, there's, I've got no concern that anybody left for any internal reasons within the team. Um, there were other opportunities that presented themselves um, that they moved on for, and as I say, some of them have remained within the council. Um, so I think partly it's unfortunate timing, the number that came all at once, um, which is obviously then less with a number of new recruits, which has impacted on the capacity within the team. Thank you, Katie. It's certainly uh, a reinforcement point that Roger made earlier on, that so much remit resources has to now be, uh, now be put to training new people. Um, I, I would hope that we might that might might have gone through some of what might be described an unfortunate period in terms of change, and that perhaps the people you're recruiting will stay with us, and that uh, we shall have a more settled team going forward. I certainly hope so, because up until then we did have a fairly um, static, long-serving team, and as James mentioned earlier, you always want that seedbed of the next trainee to develop. It's just come all in one go. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. Uh, and then my other point goes down to 7-11 at the bottom of the page. Members are reminded that where audit cannot provide independent assurance, they can at any time request managers for any of the areas identified to provide assurance directly to them. And then I want to know, how should we use this power? Because there are so many... Uh, there are so many uh, areas which uh, where independent assurance is not being provided any time. We could have 30, 40 service managers before us if we wanted to get that assurance. Um, just where do we decide as members or what guidance do we have as to our feelings of to when we should use this power? So, Chair, I think it's um, 
it, it is a question for, for, for audit committee to, to consider the examples I've given it in the past. Um, maybe that in your roles as members for the, uh, for the authority generally, um, there, there may be things that come to your attention which uh, raise questions in your mind around a particular uh, control environment uh, where you may say, um, uh, actually, I think this is something that I'd like to get some, some further assurance on. So I'm just looking at the, at the list now. Um, and so just picking one at random, PFI. So you may um, you may have uh, questions raised around, I don't know, PFI or planning or procurement cards, anything you with know, um, uh, You could, uh, and, and you may hear those, uh, those, those you know, may hear concerns or you may, um, you know, may have things raised with you. This could be from members of the public, this could be from constituents, this could be from other members. Um, and you may say, uh, actually, uh, that that is something I would, I'd like to get a little bit more assurance on in relation to the wider issue uh, that's being raised behind that. Alternatively, there may be uh, part, uh, parts of that where, you know, in terms of your own uh, knowledge, history and experience of the organisation where you say, um, actually, that's something that I think uh, I would like um, the internal audit to be looking at. Uh, and if that is not incorporated or can't be incorporated in the plan, then actually that's something I'd like to bring the, uh, the manager in to, uh, to uh, have a further conversation about and to gain some uh, assurance around that. So there's a lot there, uh, and in the same way as the internal audit team can't cover all of these areas, the audit committee can't cover those areas. Uh, but it's flagged there uh, to just to try and give a prompt so that you're not kind of blind in relation to uh, those areas that you may want to uh, ask further questions on or gain further assurance around. Well, if you could go back to 7 9 in the middle of this page, based on a risk analysis, approximately 3,753 days are required to review all high risk areas. With current resources, it would take almost four years to cover all high risk areas. So there's so many high risk areas not being covered. I wonder how we would ever decide which ones we want to call managers in provide assurances to us. Anyway, uh, so th that's the basis of my concern. And uh, if members at any stage have any particular uh, concern about a function, um, they will let me know and you know, we will arrange to have the service manager here. But it's a, <laughs> we've got so many targets, it's just a, I wonder how we decide which one to hit. There we go. Now then, the report is before us, members. Right. Roger. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I also highlighted this, and especially 7.8, which you referred to. It says, uh, has provision for posts just short of 12 full-time equivalents. Are we up to 12 full-time equivalents? I couldn't pick up in the report, how many staff we have in place as of today, if, if, if present. And uh, PFI is on my list to question, so I'm concerned, James, that we are <laughs> thinking the same, because I saw in the statement of accounts PFI and the amend there, and I see in the uh, in the future about it, and I don't think, I can't remember that ever being looked at. Is it an area we should be looking at or not? I don't know. But the full-time posts, are we up to level or, or not? Because I can understand the pressures we've already highlighted er, earlier on. Um, at present, it's, it's approximately 10. I say it's approximately because we've got a mix. We've got some part-time staff and obviously Barry and I are still in our substantive post, but covering the head of audit post. So we're at approximately 10 full-time equivalents. And so is there another question for me? It's it's how do members looking at the workload on your sorry, looking at the workload on your staff, if we wanted anything from appendix B, how would be the best way of doing it? To come forward via a working day and raise issues then or via here or not, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a mixture of ways you could do it. As we said, you could you could request that, that um, service manager come in to provide the first line assurance to you directly. Um, the other way we've done it in the past, you could it could be a topic as a training. Um, so you've had one recently on climate change, um, whether 
um, Adrian came in to provide um, additional information about what they're doing in that area um, across the council. Um, or you can raise it through through me um, if if you consider the reasons why you would consider it high risk that you'd want assurance on it for me to consider whether we can accommodate that in the plan if it's appropriate. What would I need to take out? And does that still give me the spread to give the level of assurance at year end? For me, Chairman, I think PFI would be a good topic to go on the training day. I've a, I've a section, I don't know about other colleagues around, around the table. Um, it is there, it's been in existence for a long time. My understanding of it has got a little bit hazy over time, but it is a charge on the council. I think we've only got two PFI contracts. James will enlighten us on that. Um, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got um, the uh, Quality and Community Services Quicks PFI, uh, which I think covers six or seven um, uh, properties uh, that were that were um, built and, uh, and and run under a PFI contract, and then obviously we've got the Olia uh, Waste uh, PFI contract. So those are the two that we have um, as an organisation. So, uh, well, well, we'll put it on. It, it may, may not take too long to deal with it. We'll put it on the next training programme. Will you make a note that we shall discuss PFI? As I'm not sure that all members, you know, I'm sure that all the committee do, and I'm not sure that all members actually understand now what PFI is, because it's fallen very much out of favour. The ones we've got, we've had for a long time, and we've no plans to, as I understand it, to uh, have any further PFI contracts. No, no. So, no. so we'll we'll, uh, we'll have it as a, a report on the next training programme. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Simon. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. I'm um, really a bit of a follow-up from what um, I, I think Julia was driving at. Um, we have and, sorry, 1,569 days for this year. Um, I think we're looking at um, 1,398 days next year, if that's comparing like for like. Uh, that's an 11% reduction. Um, and I'm not sure what, how many days like for like were last year. Um, but what, what concerns me is how low can we go before as an internal audit function? I mean, how what is the is there a minimum minimum number of days that internal audit can do internal audit stuff before, as um, Julia was saying, um, we've become basically ineffective. It's a really tricky question to answer. There's not a minimum number of days. It's part of that overall risk assessment as to, um, you know, point to take is as that list of high risk areas sure. gets bigger, um, my role and part of the professional standards is I have to ensure that we've got a minimum level of coverage to be able to deliver a year end audit opinion. So I'm comfortable that we have at, at present got enough resources to do that. Um, but as I said, that. In terms of what makes them high risk to appear on that list, there's a number of factors that go into it. It's quite a complicated risk assessment as mm -hmm. to, so it could be that it's an, a new area of activity within the council we've never audited. It's deemed high risk because we don't know anything about it at that point. We could go in and do an audit and it give them good assurance and it moves down. It's just that it's an unknown at the moment that makes it high risk. Um, other things that push, push it up is if we've had an unsatisfactory audit in that area or fundamental recommendation, um, so yeah, it's, it's a really challenging question, but it's that balance and the professional no, judgment. I, I, the yeah, I appreciate that you, know, you can keep squeezing juice out of the orange, but eventually there will come a time when you can't. And I think from the audit committee perspective, we really do need to know when that, when you are hitting that time uh, that you, you, you're uncomfortable, uh, that you can't actually do the job that you're required, you're expected to do. Um, so, yeah, you know, let, it, let us know, really. Yeah, if it, if it, obviously, if it got to that point, I'd be raising that with, with James. Um, I'd like to see that in a public forum, um, because if you look at it, if it was, if we keep 
reducing 10%, 10%, 10% ultimately we disappear. It's a yeah, you'd get it through the performance reports. Um, so where well, it is, it's challenging. It. I would definitely raise that as a control issue for, Thank you. for the Thank audit you. committee. Thank you. It's following on from Simon, actually, because I just got a light bulb moment as a result of what you said. If we've got a 10% reduction of available days and we've got 10 staff equivalents as opposed to 12, you're effectively two staff down, which equates to that amount. Now... When you then go to what James has uh, said in different venues about staff who uh, are not currently employed, vacant posts, not being filled to fulfil uh, how we want to move forward regarding the change of the organisation, there is a risk here that those two posts will not be filled. James has already said that we're not going to fill them at the moment because you've got enough trainees, etc., etc. But I've now just suddenly worried that those posts, you're never getting back, and that will become the new norm now, this 11% reduction. In fact, I want to flag that as a complete not a worry, uh, and I'm, that needs to be uh, recorded somewhere, because I've suddenly thought, wow, I don't, I don't like this. Well, certainly, we can record that specifically in the minutes. If you've got the context of that, Michelle, um, uh, James, yeah, so, just to give some assurance to the uh, to the committee, the um, the establishment for within the internal audit team, um, aside from the the the, uh, the 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 implications of turnover in this particular year, the twelve FTE or whatever the exact figure is, is the establishment, and there's no plans in the financial strategy, for example, to reduce or take those posts out. So what I would look at it as is, is that in the current year, because we've had all of those things hit at once, there's been an impact and quite rightly, you've seen that reduction in number of days. <clears throat> all things being equal, if everybody was in the post from the 1st of April, we would have 12 FTE. It is about just managing the recruitment and managing the, uh, the, the, the maintenance of that. Um, it's not about a, a, a reduction in the, uh, in the capacity uh, within the team. Yes, thank you. Roger. Yeah, just a query, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, in the budget, which is at present before Council, of course, there are various lines in it, but there are various lines also say that vacant posts will not be filled. Um, what I'm hearing is the assurance that these posts will be filled and they are not co covered sure. by the appropriate lines, because as an audit committee, we are concerned about our staff and resources. Yeah, and, and, and again from a chair, um, there are there are turnover um, t t turnover savings, turnover rates that have been um, assumed within the uh, within the budget setting. Um, those are fundamentally held at a directorate level, so um, I need to manage that across the whole of resources. So what I wouldn't be doing is saying everybody's got to take a hit. Um, it will be where there is turnover, we will then use that to our advantage. But fundamentally, um, it will be about um, yeah. There'll be there'll be areas that are high priority, and and the uh, the replacement of the um, or the crew within the teams of priority. The issue is more about finding the people to actually be recruited into those posts. That's where the, the concern has been. Thank you. Uh, and one final, uh, slightly lighter note. Uh, I asked Jane yesterday at. Uh, if you look at the unplanned call off list, which is on page 142, you will see it is in alphabetical order. And I asked James, how are these prioritised? And his answer was one I think you will be intrigued by. <laughs> I don't know what it was now. But <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it was. Yeah. Um, the the um, I think the, the well I think Kate, Kate, Kate has already made the the, the point if I um, uh, if I remember correctly uh, these are all listed in alphabetical order but there is a process by, by whereby which um, all of these uh, areas are identified as high risk um, for for consideration uh, so there's a there's a series of, uh, of considerations that then put these uh, to the effectively the top of the list uh, and then there's a line drawn across which says 
this is the point where we, uh, this is the level of resources that we have that, that, we, that we deal with that. Um, so there are some of these that we would consider to be higher risk than others. And um, what we don't want to do is to list those high risk areas in a high risk order, if you know what I mean, don't put it into a further order than that to, to you know, highlight further concerns, let's say. So we just do it on an alphabetical order, so it's just listed there. But we have our own, uh, you know, if there are available days, as, as, um, as Katie alluded to, um, if there are days that we can then bring into the plan, we know which of these we would go straight to. We wouldn't just go to the, you know, start with A or, or, or pick randomly with a... Um, That's not what you told me. <laughs> I'll tell you what you told me. You said we're not going to put them in order. That, that, uh, that officers uh, heading those functions can see because we don't want to let them know that they're the next on the list. We're going to, we're going to drop on them to uh, make sure that they are not uh, prepared simply to answer your questions, that yeah. we want to know they're on top of their, their, their work. Yeah. It, so it's a matter of keeping it secret so that <laughs> so that somebody who deals with uh, Baxter IP, whatever Baxter IP might be, for instance, doesn't know that they're uh, under consideration to be next audited. So it, it, it was a, a secret plan to... That, that is correct. Um, right. yeah. I, I, you're right, I didn't want to say that. Well, I don't want to say it publicly. <laughs> Right, keep them, keep them all, keep all those functions guessing. Right, shall we concur with and approve the annual work plan for the uh, coming year 2023-24? Agreed to approve the annual work plan. Thank you both very much. We'll now return to the agenda in its order and uh, you can go to item six. First line assurance, purchase of electric control improvements is on page 13. And uh, Katie, you're going to introduce this. No, it's Ben's online. Oh, Ben's online. Yeah. Oh. So um, uh, Ben can uh, introduce this if you're happy with that, Chair. Yeah, of course. It's ben. Thank, I, thank you, Chip. Line assurance, purchase electric control improvements. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to um, listening um, with great interest to the conversation and the early part of the, the agenda. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time um, on, on this um, report unless the um, committee wish to go into further detail around it. Um, so very simply, I think it, it set out the, um, the overview um, on that position um, in the synopsis and the executive summary uh, and the recommendations for the committee to note the contents of the report and the progress being made um, to date to address that. Um, I think this is something which uh, just to, to add to it is um, very much part of the work that Cheryl and I are doing to ensure that we are making sure both within the finance team um, but also more broadly across the council that we've got um, work up to date and bringing up to date and using best practice around purchase ledger um, issues. Um, and I really, I think, just wanted to leave it there, Chair, um, but happy to take questions. And if there's anything particularly detailed, I know Cheryl is also on the call, um, so I'm, I may need to defer to her and her greater level of expertise around it. But um, just in terms of introducing it, Chair, nothing particularly to add other than the report, which is before the committee. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, before I go to Roger, remind us all again of Ben's position in the organisation. <laughs> so, excuse me, so um, actually I'll refer to this a bit later on as well when we get onto the, uh, the, the, the Treasury paper. Um, so, um, I've retained the, the role of uh, Section 151 officer, um, but Ben has been brought in as, as my new deputy Section 151 officer, and his role is to cover um, the, uh, the finance team, uh, the Bears and Benz team and the um, uh, the, uh, the IT team, uh, basically. So he's, he's my deputy 151 uh, picking up those areas. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Roger. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've highlighted a few items in this report. Uh -huh. um, page 13, second purchase ledger audit report following the ERP, uh, limited level of assurance. Um, on top of the next page, page 14, 
The report found that whilst there is basically a sound system of control in place, the system contains weaknesses, which leaves some risks unaddressed. And further down, um, there is the not possible to provide full management. And then the audit report, uh, the three accepted within the audit report <coughs> as not feasible currently. I understand there might be extra work, but that not currently fills me. Then we go on to 7.2, and it picks up the ERP, which we've raised previously, uh, into 8.2, where it was re uh, received there, three recommendations rejected. It was accepted the priority was to address the volume of retrospective POs raised and invoices submitted. Further down, as was not feasible and was not currently mandated. And then if we go to 8.6, uh, there is a reference there, the fifth bullet point there, contingency arrangements in case of IT failure to be addressed as part of cyber preparedness work. Are we not there already? Right, well, I think we'd better yeah. go yeah. through the raise your first point. We'll deal with it point by point. Yeah, yeah. the first I point is two is is two point three on page thirteen. What was the point on two point three? Uh, it resulted in limited assurance. This was a second purchase ledger report, and then it is expanded further yeah. down in that in that in that section in the summary. It two point four, uh, two point six, and two point eight. So who can answer that? Is it Katie or is it uh, ben. Not ben, I think? Ben, Ben. Yeah. Abby to pick that up initially, Chair. Um, I think the some of the key work around that is um, particularly around that no PO, no pay policy and the way that that's being worked through. Uh, this is something which we're working through um, both in terms of the way in which budget holders uh, process um, payments through the ledger, but also in terms of the way in which we report that internally. So we've been uh, we're increasingly um, giving prominence to where the uh, where purchase orders are being raised in a timely manner versus those areas where sometimes what happens is that the, the invoice is received and then you raise the purchase order uh, in reverse. There's a number of financial and controls reasons why that isn't a great way to do it. Um, more simply, actually, it just it's a more timely, pro um, a more time consuming process to do it that way around. So we're trying to save colleagues time by helping them to do it in the right way. Um, I think that's the, the headline for me around that. Um, Councillor Evans just to respond to that, um, unless Cheryl wanted to come in and bring in any uh, other points around that but that's the headline for me okay yeah, i think i'd just add that when when the erp went live we obviously made a number of um, improvements to our processes but one thing that we didn't implement straight away was the no po no pay approach um, it was deemed that that was possibly a bridge too far in terms of the, the system being implemented. So um, 12 months, 18 months down the line, we then did implement that. So while it's now in use at the council, I wouldn't say it's been applied perfectly. And that's that's some of the issues that have been identified in the report, that there's further work to be done. We are trying to report to service areas where they're not applying the no PO, no pay um, approach, but whether they're actually addressing that, that's something we still need to do further work on. So I think it's just highlighting that really. Right, Roger, your next point. Yeah, next point is 7.2, Chairman, and it's about the two thirds of the way through that paragraph. There, however, there are still a number of issues from the go live in the procured pay and the workflow processes that have not been rectified by the supplier. Happy to pick that one up, Chair. Um, I think the position on that one um, is kind of twofold. Um, so first of all, the supplier um, was very much sort of held to account around that, and we've got some significant progress around it. Um, the progress, that's kind of the second point around that, is that the workflow processes have actually proved to be really quite complicated to unpick and, un uh, and understand the problem with it. Um, as at um, around about mid-December, and it took them several months to get to that point, the supplier was able to replicate the problem that we were finding within the ERP, uh, and they're now in the process of putting together a fix that we're going to be able to apply. Um, so I think the at the point of preparing the um, report, the rectification is not yet complete, but we have now got a clear, um, clear line of sight into um, exactly how that will be achieved, and we're working with them to get that in place as quickly as possible. So um, it hasn't been 
workflow processes hadn't been rectified at the point of preparing some of these issues and the update on the audit, but they are now in hand um, and the supplier is um, appropriately supporting us in order to be able to get to that point. Uh, I think 8.2 has been answered in a previous one. So if I go straight to 8.6 and the fifth bullet point there, contingency arrangements in case of IT failure to be addressed as part of cyber preparedness work. Um, read about certain councils have been under attack and they've <laughs> succumbed to it. Uh, how, what is the position with us when, when I see that? Uh, do we still need to do work and to be prepared? Uh, so again, Chair, I'm happy to respond to the councillors' questions. Um, I, I think to answer your point simply, Councillor um, Evans, we will always need to do work. Um, there was a conversation, I think the, the committee will recall from uh, the summer, um, where we were talking about the level of attacks that we were um, uh, sustaining um, and we were finding that it was around about the level of um, half a million attacks a day. This is fairly straightforward. You can just automate it. Um, we are dealing with those at that level of about half a million a day. The last I heard from IT, um, a course estimate is that that's probably increased to around about three and a half million attacks per day. Um, so we're working in an escalating and uh, troubling situation. That's the downside. The upside is um, we have recently put into place um, work around contingency arrangements and improving our backup arrangements so that we are much better able to ensure um, that we have got a full level of backup available at all points. Um, so that's in hand, that's been delivered. Um, we have also worked with a third party supplier so that we're no longer relying on the um, three or four members of the retained um, permanent staff to help us to defend against um, cyber attacks. Um, we also have the benefit of working with a supplier that can provide um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year cover. Um, additioning, uh, additional to that, what that means is that we are able to automate regular reviews of the effectively the firewalls that we're, we have in operation Sometimes that identifies that actually a patch hasn't been applied or an update is available that flags it. So we're able to get ahead of all of those attacks that we're batting away um, effectively. Um, so I think the contingency arrangements that are being put in place around uh, failure um, and the cyber preparedness, that is, we're well on with that, but that will continue to be a core area of the, our activity um, as we go into the future. I think that one of the great things and um, one of the reasons why it's really good to be working uh, with David Baker as the new head of IT um, is actually he's a, a national prize winner around um, cyber preparedness. So he's got a really good insight into this and he's providing some really great support into the team um, to ensure that actually the council as a whole uh, is effectively protected. So I think there's um, a lot of challenge there um, as the Councillor has rightly pointed out, um, but I think there's also, as, as I hope you can hear, there's a lot of really good um, activity that's been undertaken in recent months to improve the council's position, but we're not going to rest on our laurels because this will continue to get more challenging. Thank you. Right, no other comments. Shall we resolve to note progress to date with first line assurance on the purchase budget for improvements? To note progress to date. Great, thank you. Now move to item seven, much Le Menlock Leisure Centre, much Wenlock Leisure Centre, uh, and that's on page 19 to 36. Uh, is Claire online? Yes, so she is. Yes, Claire. Hello, Claire. Good morning. Can you take us uh, through the salient points of this report? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, adopting uh, Ben's brief approach to the introduction. Um, this is a, a an audit report uh, or a response to an audit report that was carried out on uh, Much Wenlock Leisure Centre, which we operate on behalf of William Brook School. Um, interested to to hear the previous discussion. Um, there were some very genuine con concerns that we had to deal with over the pandemic, <laughs> and to do with staffing. Uh, so I would like to uh, <laughs> add that these are, are not excuses. Um, many of the staff were redeployed and the complexity of closing and reopening uh, leisure centres and engaging with our communities through that process um, was extremely complex. Um, we are now making good progress on this um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Grant Wilson, who's on the call as well. Grant is our 
uh, infrastructure compliance and contracts manager um, and who's been working with staff across the leisure centre to uh, implement the required changes. Um, you'll see the progress that's been made. There are some outstanding <coughs> actions that we are um, committed to delivering by June. Um, and we are using this as a very useful process to inform how we work in the other two uh, directly managed leisure centres at Church Stretton and Bishop's Castle. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, on a point about audit and and how you're working with the um, services, as head of service, I would really support the approach that Katie very much takes, which is about rather than catching us doing things wrong, it's about helping us get things right. And I think that's a really important um, message going forward. But if there's any questions, um, either myself or Grant are happy to answer them. Any questions on the report? No. Well, thank you for that explanation, Claire. We are grateful and we'll note and accept the report. Thank you for your thank attendance. Thank you very much. Bye. OK, uh, so we've now come to uh, item eight, uh, second line assurance, strategic risk update. This came later than the other papers. Uh, and uh, our last... Jane Cooper, if she's available. Yes, there she is. Hello, Jane. Good morning. To introduce this report. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the strategic risk um, review report uh, sets out the position on the strategic risks following the most recent review, which was December. Um, the strategic risks historically were formally reviewed and reported on, on a quarterly basis. Um, however, the executive management team uh, review individual strategic risks on a rolling program at their weekly team meetings. Um, and therefore, the formal reviews have now been changed to a by annual reviews in line with the operational risk reviews. So the operational risk review will take place first to enable us to feed in any emerging themes uh, up to the executive directors as part of the strategic risk review. And uh, any emerging themes can then be considered during that time as inclusion as a potential strategic risk. Um, as a result of the latest review, three, re three risks um, as identified in the uh, report had their scores changed. Uh, so one went up and two came down. So the inability to deliver a balanced budget uh, uh, had a slight increase in score and that will be uh, subject to an interim review uh, prior to the next uh, scheduled reporting review to assess the need to potentially increase the impact on that one um, if the situation is not demonstrated as improving. Um, failure to safeguard vulnerable children, um, that one came down. Uh, the scoring on that one came down, so it's now a medium risk, which was a high risk previously. And we had a, 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 a further re, uh, reduction in the ICT infrastructure reliance risk. Uh, and that's a second consecutive review where that risk has um, reduced, indicating a more positive direction of travel as a result of implementing additional controls. Um, as mentioned earlier in the meeting, uh, a new risk has been added to our strategic risk environment as a number of uh, issues had been raised through operational risk reviews and discussions, indicating the necessity to include a risk in relation to recruitment, retention and succession planning. Um, it is considered currently that that is quite a high risk for us, um, but there is already some movement in the right direction to reduce the severity of that risk. Uh, we've also had a change to an existing strategic risk, which was the ability to fund children's services. Uh, and with the approval of the executive director of people, that is going to be separated into two risks, one of which will be ability to fund children's social care and safeguarding and ability to fund uh, learning and skills for the other one. Uh, and that's a result of the fact that the funding mechanisms and management controls, assurances and scoring will differ between the two areas of children's social care and safeguarding and learning and skills. Um, it's not reflected in the table that's actually within the report currently as a strategic risk report is currently with the executive management team for final sign off. However, that will be reflected in the next review. 
Um, the annual, we hold an annual strategic risk workshop with the uh, executive management team and that will be held in June and during that review all risks despite the fact that they're on uh, a rolling programme of review anyway will be discussed in detail um, and will include an assessment of any slippages in achieving year-end target dates uh, scores and agreeing new target scores for the 2023-24 period. So that's as succinct as I can get it with the time frames that we're working to this morning, Chair. So important to report, you dealt with it very uh, specifically. Thank you. Uh, Comment, Roger. Thank you, Chairman. It may be catered in here, I'm not sure, but recently I became aware and maybe others became first aware that there is a project at present um, that this council is uh, up is involved with, and it's the Northwest Relief Road, and I'm not going down that avenue no, of the Northwest Relief Road. Road. But However, <laughs> there is £20 million pound at present being spent, and I have recently been told that if that project did not go ahead, that £20 million pound would then have to go into the revenue budget, which would put this council at real risk of not being able to deliver the services that it is legally supposed to do. So uh, it has not yet got the appropriate permissions to go ahead, but money is still being spent. So where does that risk that that 20 million pound, it isn't like it isn't happening today, but there is a risk that that 20 million pound could have to go into the revenue side of the budget. And I note about the um, inability to deliver a balanced budget. Is it included in that, which is only 20 and not the 25, where some of the others, and I see it has gone up or not. So it is it is a risk that there is uh, money being spent, which could yeah. have a resounding risk on this council. But where about in those risks is it? I think I'll try to steer in keeping the audit side of it rather than anything else, Chairman. Well, well I'll go first and then. Well, I'll simply yeah. say I think there are, uh, scrutiny elements of that rather than all these elements. But uh, in the, I'll let James respond to that. I'll, I'll, uh, James may wish to, to add to this, but just very, very simply, um, we have to think about the way in which those, you know, what the risk is to the organisation. So um, a risk in relation to that particular uh, issue raised there, is there a financial risk? That financial risk would feed into the inability to deliver a balanced budget. That would, that would be taken into account of the robustness of estimates that would be taken into account in relation to the medium term financial strategy. So all of those elements in relation to the financial elements of all of the things that we do are picked up within that particular strategic risk. In terms of the project itself, there will be a, a project risk register around the North East Relief Road, around any of the major projects, um, which then considers the deliverability uh, risk associated with that, which Jane may, miss, may or may not wish to comment on, other than perhaps just to confirm that that risk register does exist and those are taken into account. But that would be the way that we manage this. Yeah, so the... So, sorry, I was Did just going to add... comment on that? The, the thing I would like to comment on that is that there is a robust risk register in place for the um, Northwest Relief Road. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of work that is undertaken with the Department of Transport um, in relation to how, how funding is spent on that. Um, there's obviously a key gateway of submission of any sort of final business case in relation to that as well. Um, and that will be going to full council before submission. Um, so that gives um, members the opportunity to um, discuss and comment on that. Um, the North West Relationship Project does follow the corporate risk management process and there is also some further enhanced um, by more technical risk management at a project level um, included in that as well. Um, and obviously the project lead on that is always happy to come and discuss matters of concern with audit committee uh, as and when you would like them to come in and do that as well. Uh, thank you. Well, probably this will be resolved before the next audit committee <laughs> with the Go ahead, get into the Northwest Relief Road. Anyway, um, any other comments? Jim, yeah, um, I'm not clear in the project risk. That's mm -hmm. completely out with this. It's the risk to the council should the project not go ahead due to a decision because politically, with a small P, with a small P, 
politically there are substantial the, the council is divided on this at present the majority is to go ahead and it could well change in whenever mm. so there is a risk to the council that the decision to go ahead may or may not be changed and i understand it's going ahead so i'm not saying it isn't but does that risk is that reflected in this risk register Yes, it will be. So we monitor the, the uh, project risk register on a regular basis. It's due for another review at the current time. So I've got an appointment in with the project lead to go through the risks on that. There are risks in place on that in relation to the project not going ahead. And any indication of that would then feed into, as James mentioned, to the inability to deliver a balanced budget strategic risk. Okay. All right. Shall we accept the report with thanks? Accept the report. Agreed. Thank you. Um, I think now, before we move to item nine, second line assurance, uh, Treasury strategy will have a five minute break. Uh, so it's 11.45. I will try to resume promptly at 11.50.
responsible officer report. Yes. So thank you, Chair. Um, okay, so um, I'll give a very brief introduction to the Treasury strategy. So this, this sets out the um, uh, the approach for 22-24. The strategy in itself is is in line with um, with the previous strategies that have been produced. Um, this will be considered today. An audit committee will go on to um, a cabinet tomorrow, along with the, uh, the quarter three uh, Treasury uh, monitoring report, uh, and then we'll go on to full council for adoption uh, on the 2nd of March. So um, the strategy itself uh, sets out um, the uh, really two main things. One is around uh, the, the, the market conditions that we're currently uh, working within. Um, normally that is for um, kind of information, but clearly um, what we've seen after a long, long period of low interest rates uh, and a kind of very, very stable market, uh, very low levels of um, um, of return on investments uh, and actually very uh, low levels uh, of, of interest rates on, on borrowing potential. Uh, we're now moving out of that, given the, the very high levels of inflation that we're, we're seeing at the moment. Uh, that's driving uh, investment returns to a high level uh, and is bringing some, some more um, uh, uh, you know, variability and, and alternatives back into the market. Um, it also means that the cost of borrowing uh, is clearly impacted, although indirectly, uh, in relation to those, uh, those those raising interest rates. And therefore, it does mean that there are there are changes and implications for um, uh, for, for the the organisation as and when borrowing needs to be undertaken. And I just remind committee that um, as an authority, we haven't borrowed uh, on the external market. Uh, for a number uh, a number of years. The other part to the Treasury strategy fundamentally is around the potential indicators. Uh, these are a set of indicators that are um, uh, identified across the country. All, all local authorities need to ensure that they're producing these uh, and it gives a measure of the, um, uh, the, the, the financial viability from a capital point of view and from a borrowing point of view um, uh, for the, uh, the organisation. Um, the, the only other thing that I would mention, just uh, from a uh, from a, from a government point of view, and just to, to um, uh, just to, just to give some reassurance to the uh, to the committee in relation to the way that, that treasury management is is managed. Um, so, uh, for a number of years now, um, treasury uh, the treasury function has sat with the pensions function, and treasury uh, treasury and pensions manager uh, Justin Bridges has been the, uh, the, the 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 officer who's overseen. Uh, both of those, uh, both of those sides. Um, with uh, with my change in role, um, uh, what I have done is stepped back from the uh, the pensions side. So I used to be the pension scheme administrator for Shropshire County Pension Fund. Uh, that role has now changed to uh, the uh, senior officer for uh, LGPS. Um, that role has now been taken up by Justin, which means his role has changed, which therefore means the treasury function we're shifting across. Um, and the Treasury function will in future sit under Ben. Now, at the moment, we're in a transitionary uh, period. Ben Jay, sorry, um, uh, who's on the screen. Um, the, um, uh, we're at the moment in a transitionary period. And uh, so, so Justin and his team are still um, uh, basically producing the, you know, doing the Treasury work. Um, but uh, this report was produced by, uh, by Ben uh, with, with their support. Um, so that we can uh, start to shift across now to um, uh, to the to the new roles going forward. So uh, there, there, there should be no material change in relation to what we do, uh, but just from a governance point of view, I just wanted to be clear that uh, going forward it will be Ben's responsibility rather than uh, Justin's. Uh, for those of you that have um, uh, have been aware of that uh, in the past, so I'll leave the introduction uh, there, uh, Chair. Uh, but any questions that you were uh, any uh, that I have, I just tell. Yeah, our Treasury management. Has always been a very high order, producing uh, results uh, ahead of greater than than the, than the benchmark for other authorities with this work. Uh, so we've never had any concerns, to my memory, about our treasury strategy. And I hope that will continue. Any comments? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thanks, James. Um, the prudential indicators—they're uh, not an easy easy read. Um, and I, I'd just like to know, uh, I'd be grateful if you could explain, like, who sets them uh, um, for each individual uh, uh, local authority, presumably, and 
is, is it a national? Are they nationally set? Because really, they're lending or borrowing guidelines in in, in you know in, in much more technical detail. Um, so I just want to sort of make sure that it's not sort of poacher gamekeeper sort of stuff. Because if you set them and then fail to move, <laughs> just move them as it were. So yeah, how does that work? So so I, I, I'll hand over to it. Uh, Debate might be able to give a bit more more detail, but fundamentally these are uh, the potential indicators. They fall from the potential code. Uh, the way that the the way that this works now, um, the government used to set a number of things in statute, and and therefore those things needed to be changed um, uh, over uh, uh, yeah that statute needed to be changed whenever there was there was changes or requirements for uh, for uh, uh, that that to be reconsidered. Um, effectively, what they've done now is statute says that SIPFA, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, which is the, the accountancy body that oversees public finance, um, the, the, the statute now requires you to follow their guidance. So that what that means is, is that SIPFA can then uh, update and, and produce guidance as and when that's necessary. Uh, and then effectively uh, all local authorities have to follow that. So the potential code uh, is produced um, uh, basically by SIPFA, uh, and that's a national requirement then that we are, we are watching. And that's the numbers in the potential code, not the, the headlines. So that's the that that's what the um, the, what the measures are uh, within that. So those measures and how they are defined and how they are calculated are set, are set within that potential code. Okay, thank you. Um, page 39, you refer to as the colour bands, green, pink, blue, whatever it is. Where do they come from? Do they mean... Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, um, <laughs> what we have this is for um, the specified investments. So, uh, the investments are classified into different uh, different classifications, um, and we use those as the basis for um, how long we could uh, we can uh, lend to those uh, those organisations, what their credit worthiness is. Um, uh, how much we would uh, we'd be able to apply, et cetera. Um, so we have, what we try to do is to make sure that we have uh, a range, it's about spreading the risk ultimately. Yep. So we have a, a, a different range from those. If we had them all within one particular rating or within one particular geography or within one particular um, uh, security rating. Yeah, that, it, that it ensures be... you have diversity you know, Absolutely. Your and the current coding uh, is the way of managing to ensure it. And my final question is, um, I've always been concerned about the, the lending to local government because it's not rated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think any, any of us have been in any way involved in the whole budget process. Each local government which we're lending to, for whatever reason, is not finding it easy to balance their budget. So we know there's local governments, which, uh, local authorities which have gone in, into uh, bankruptcy, basically. How do we ensure, given that the local governments that we, uh, authorities that we're lending to, um, how do we ensure that they're sound? Because there, there's no rating system for them. Um, so, so there's, so there's, there's two parts to this. Um, number one is is that um, basically a local authority can't go bust. That you know they, they are underwritten by the government, so there will always be. Um, government backed security. So, in oh, the okay. same way that we have a number of banks, national banks that are backed by, so they may have a credit rating of whatever, but they're actually backed by the, the government of that country. Um, the same applies in, in local authorities. So, local authorities can't go bust. So, there, there is always that credit rating. So, there, there. when you say contingency of uh, um, uh, security, because yeah. uh, I couldn't find out what that actually was, yeah, yeah. but what, it, what you're now saying is that it's uh, local authorities are guaranteed by the central government. Yeah, yeah, so as long as the it, UK isn't uh, downgraded lower than yeah, AA, so, we're in a good space. So, so yeah, so, so, so fundamentally, um, it, 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 again, it's written into, into, into statute, it's not written into the Treasury policy, but yeah, um, it's, it's a standard that, that local authorities can't go to. The second thing is um, there is a very real difference between cash flow bankruptcy and um, the ability to balance their budget. So um, a number of local authorities that have uh, been subject to public interest reports or have issued section 114 notices um, from their credit worthiness, from their bank balances, no issues whatsoever. Right. So um, a number of authorities have been at pains to say 
um, while we have this 114 in place or while we have it has no impact whatsoever uh, and some authorities get nervous about bending or borrowing from those um, so so th there are a number of, of, of areas a number of reasons why there are a lot, a lot of controls around um, around local government which which reduces that that risk um, so what it then comes down to is diversity and what it comes down to is that 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 um, that yeah that um, uh, that, that the, the yield that comes from that as to whether they, they fall into that play or not Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, shall we endorse the strategy for 2023-24 and uh, pass it on to Cabinet and Council? Agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Can we now go to uh, uh, second, 10, second line assurance, annual review of counter fraud, bribery and uh, anti-corruption strategy? Now, in the absence of Barry, um, uh, paternity leave, or whatever we might refer it to, uh, fair to call it, um, shall we ask Katie to provide us with a report? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, this report outlines the measures undertaken to evaluate the potential for the occurrence of fraud and how the Council manages these risks, the uh, prevention, detection, investigation. And subsequent reporting of fraud, bribery, and corruption. Uh, members are asked to consider and endorse with appropriate comment the counter fraud, bribery, and anti corruption strategy and the measures undertaken, which are detailed in the report, to manage the associated risk of fraud, bribery, and corruption. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, internal audit work to the public sector internal audit standards and as part of that we have a responsibility to evaluate the potential for the occurrence of fraud and the subsequent management response. This report sets out some of the practices we employ to evaluate and manage the risks including involvement with the National Fraud Initiative. Um, so uh, from paragraph 8.1 onwards it details all the areas that we review to consider the council's um, fraud response so there's also some minor changes to the policy which um, are attached to the appendix. Um, I didn't propose to talk you through each of them, but I'm happy to take questions on them. But for information, they're there to give you a flavour of all the processes we have in place of the horizon scanning to look at the national picture and Shropshire specific issues that might be affecting us relating to fraud. <laughs> Apologies for my voices on the way out. So as part of that, we look at best practice. So we um, sit for have a code of practice on managing the risk of fraud, and we look to other um, bodies such as Alarm or the National Fraud Authority and the Institute for Internal Auditors. Paragraph 8.10 details the action plan um, that the audit committee have approved to review fraud um, risk across the authority. Um, the main point to look at, we're in the middle of the next NFI, National Fraud Initiative Exercise. <coughs> and we just received the results of those and we're working through them with the service areas. Um, any minor changes to report to the counter fraud, bribery, and anti corruption strategy highlighted, bold italics underlined in the report. It's mainly around the change in title from the head of audit to the chief audit executive. I pause there and I'm um, happy to take your questions <laughs> as best I can. Bear in mind, it's Barry's report, but um, I'll answer them as best as I can. It's certainly a very comprehensive and, and actually very clear to understand report. Any comments? Or I'm really happy to do um, Just a very quick one. <laughs> um, you, you say, I think it's on page 42, that there's um, there may have been a bit of a resistance of doing employees completing the anti-fraud e-learning. Do, do you have any numbers around how many have yet to do it? Uh, because it, it, it is pretty fundamental to how you do your business, I would think, well, in any private or public environment. I don't have the figures to hand, but if you're happy to, I can circulate them. Yeah, might just leave, it um, just fleshes out the report a bit. But otherwise, thank you, and I'll endorse it. Uh, that does... The corollary to that is, of course, how do line managers ensure that their staff does do complete the report? What pressure is there uh, from those in uh, 
positions of responsibility to ensure that lower down the line everybody uh, completes this training. Yeah. So we, we, we do have um, escalation processes uh, in place so it gets raised um, at a high level. We then follow that up uh, with, um, with um, uh, publicity and uh, cascading it down through the, uh, the various teams, putting a, a, a press on it to make sure that these things are completed. Um, and we do that from time to time with, with all of these elements. Um, so, uh, so it's, uh, not just around this, but uh, a, a number of kind of mandatory areas yeah. training. Like cyber security and so on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, shall we uh, accept the report, members? Agree, we accept the report. Thank you. Um, we then move to the agenda item 11, which is the annual review of audit committee terms of reference. Uh, at the bottom of paragraph 2 1 on the front page, it said suggested changes are underlined and shown in bold italics, uh, but there are none such in the report, which just seems to indicate, of course, that we've repeated last year's report because there are no changes. Um, and uh, I suggest that we found it satisfactory last year, our terms of reference, and that we conclude they are, again, proposed to be in a satisfactory manner. So unless there are any uh, questions, I move that we approve for another year. Agreed? Thank you. Right. Uh, we now move to item uh, 14, I think. Well, sorry, Governance Assurance, yeah. Perhaps page 81 of your papers. And Katie is again uh, going to introduce this. Busy lady today, Katie. You'll be sick of hearing from me by the end of the uh, So this is a review of the Audit Committee's annual work and future learning development requirements. Uh, so this provides um, a breakdown of the proposed um, reports that will be coming to each committee and within Appendix A, it gives you the reason why they're coming to you, so it links it back to your terms of reference so that you can understand why you're receiving that information. And so annually, you agree a plan of work, which includes uh, learning and development um, training sessions. Um, Appendix B lists the proposed areas work for consideration for members to decide which areas they'd like additional training in. Uh, so in terms of recommendations, uh, it's to approve with appropriate comment the audit committee work plan for 23-24, which is attached at Appendix A. And page 104 of that appendix gives you the summary to give you a, a, an overview of what is expected to come to each um, committee. And Appendix B is the consideration of the potential areas for training and development. Uh, so it's proposed again this year that training is provided in three half-day sessions over the next 12 months. Uh, with the proposed dates in that Appendix A, um, but really it's for the committee to decide at this point are there any topics to consider for those, those training sessions. And um, Councillor Evans mentioned a potential for the PFI um, projects to come forward, uh, or if there's any adjustments to those training dates or the workload as to which reports are coming to each committee. Thank you, Katie. If I could. Uh our first bite at this report. I take you to 7 8, para 7 8 on page 84, <clears throat> which page 7 8, the second sentence says Members may also want to hear from key officers of the council where new or changing activities and risks are emerging and we can request this as part of their training. Well, I understand. I think other members understand as well, that there's to be a new and significant way of working across the council as a whole to reduce costs substantially and produce a balanced budget for 24-25 current year. When will we hear about this? And, <clears throat> and uh, can understand how it is going to impact on our audit work. 
James. Um, so what, what specifically are you asking for? Well, <clears throat> uh, I understand that work is going ahead among all the senior staff to provide a completely new way of uh, the council functioning uh, in order to reduce costs by many millions of pounds in order to produce a balanced budget in 23, 20, uh, 24, 25, 24. Yeah. where we're about 50 million short of the yes. numbers, aren't we? Yeah. When are we going to be hearing about the new methods of work to uh, save that substantial sum of money? Um, okay, so uh, I think we, we need we need to consider that as part of the audit planning um, work as to what elements of that audit committee would want to have um, visibility on. So there is there, there there is work within the existing internal audit plan <coughs> that will pick up things like uh, review of the medium term financial strategy um, and the way in which um, uh, those sorts of elements are are, are managed. Um, we wouldn't ordinarily bring something to audit committee around um, uh, around the savings plan. Um, we do have the, the regular monitoring reports. We do have the performance uh, reports, uh, which provide the kind of the delivery of that. I think in terms of the, the control framework and the implications in relation to that, in relation to the 50 million pounds savings, um, I'd need to consider what elements of that would be appropriate for audit to to consider. Um, and it might be that as part of the, the training sessions, you might just want to have um, a consideration of that. So as an example, this afternoon, we've got a session around uh, financial resilience. That's more based around a, a kind of a performance position. Nevertheless, financial resilience does form part of assurance in relation to, uh, to, to that gain by audit committee. We're planning to record that session this afternoon, by the way, so um, audit, mem audit committee members that aren't able to make it will be able to review that and consider that. So it might be something along those lines that we could bring into, uh, into audit committee, if that would be helpful. Well, yes, I go back to the sentence in 7-8. Members may also want to hear the key officers yeah. and can request this as part of their training. Yeah. I think we would, I personally, would want to hear about this as part of our training because, as I understand it, it's going to be such a substantial change in our working practices, yeah. in the council's working practices, that uh, we need to have a complete understanding of what is um, actually taking place. So, uh, <clears throat> I leave it to you uh, to consider that we would want to know about this as part of our training maybe it will be appropriate for the next training so yeah okay anything else on this report uh, oh rogers please thank you chairman um i concur with what your what i think you're suggesting this is to do with a new contract that the council may let to look at how it does things the contract is for a number of over more than a million pound it could be something above that which may well affect the council and the way it performs and i think i agree i think audit does need to look at how this may affect the way this council operates and the, the, the audit systems and and uh, are in place and i assume this is this is what you're referring to mm -hmm. so i do read in the press about this happening and I presume it'll have to go to council or wherever to get agreed but it does seem to be a fundamental difference in the way the council is going to uh, run itself in the future. Okay so you yes. concur that we will have to request this as part of our wish to hear as part of our training next and presumably the speed of through it. this is happening it will come to our next training session. Yeah, okay, we can do that. I'll put that in. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Shall we approve the work plan and the development plan? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Um, third lot, item 14, report of the audit review of risk management, page 129 to 132. 
again, this is uh, Katie to uh, report on it, but it's such a brief report that I think I shall simply uh, ask members if they have any questions on it. If there are no questions, everybody's happy. Shall we uh, agree to accept the report? Agreed? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now we come to the a big item, the approval of the council statement of accounts, item 16, uh, which was a to follow re report. And uh, I'll ask James to introduce it. Bearing in mind, of course, that we had a training session, uh, which Ben Jay took us through on the approvals of council statement of accounts. James. Okay, so um, thank you, Chair. I'll just give a very uh, brief introduction, just to say that um, the statement of accounts, the, uh, the, the, the 2021 and the 21-22 uh, accounts are um, appended to the, uh, to the report. Um, both accounts have yet to be signed off. They've been uh, produced, and uh, there's been you're, you're fully aware uh, of the uh, the process that we've had to go through in relation to um, getting those accounts signed off. Um, so they're still currently uh, with uh, with Grant Thornton uh, awaiting for that final uh, sign off. I'm not intending to go through the statement of accounts, um, given that uh, you've now already received these uh, a number of times and, and already considered them. Um, so I would not be looking to open up questions around the accounts themselves. Um, instead, we can just focus on um, uh, any any changes or any uh, material differences and an update in relation to uh, where we've got to. Um, so at that point, um, I hand over to uh, to Ben or to um, to Cheryl, uh, just in relation to uh, the kind of the current status of where we are in relation to uh, statement of accounts. And also, uh, Grant is, uh, is here from Van Thornton, um, who may wish to comment on uh, where uh, where they are up to in relation to the, uh, to the audit, which then flows into the next item, item 17. So, Ben, you can come in here. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll introduce Cheryl shortly just to um, bring you up to date on some of the detail uh, around where we're up to. Um, absolutely echoing what James has just been saying. Um, obviously, the, there's been, um, uh, a, kind of call it a long and winding road to get the 2021 accounts um, in, in to, to, the, uh, to the committee today. And um, I won't rehearse all of that. I think there's been updates along the way. Uh, the important point at the moment is that there's been a lot of work, not least in the last few weeks, um, some huge effort put in from, um, from the finance and accountancy team, um, but also really good support from the Grant Thornton team around this. Um, it's moving forward very steadily. We've got to the point now where there's there's only a couple of small points now to be um, to be resolved. Um, I think the, the important point here is really um, this is not nothing to do with me. This started a long time before I started. It's Cheryl and the team who've carried this one and, and brought it to fruition. So, um, just Cheryl, if you could just um, bring through any of the key kind of key points around the final pieces of work that the committee should be aware of in terms of signing off the accounts um, and the completion of those points picked up in the audit findings report. Um, but otherwise, um, I'll, I'll leave Cheryl to take you through that. You're in good hands, as, as I'm sure the committee knows. Um, but otherwise, I think it's just uh, important that we we get into the end of this process um, and. And very shortly, we will be bringing you the 22-23 accounts and we will enjoy that one as well. Cheryl, I'll pass over to you if that's OK, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, as Ben said, we're, we're pretty much there now. So the accounts <coughs> are before you. Um, we've made all the changes that we were aware, aware of um, up until that point. Um, work has been ongoing with the auditors at the moment, particularly around the infrastructure assets. As we said, that was something that came out quite late in January, um, and we've been working through the implications of that. The auditors now have all of our documentation around what our proposals are for that, how we fed that into the accounts, and they're just looking at those proposals and asking a few questions about what our, our assumptions have been around that. So there's a few little bits that just need to be sort of signed off around that. But as I say, we're in regular dialogue with the auditors. I had meetings yesterday with um, with Mary, who's on the call as well, just to discuss um, what, what we've done. So hopefully that will be there or thereabouts. 
about. There's a couple of, I think, disclosure points that we just need to go back to the auditors on. But as far as I'm aware, I think that's all that's still outstanding from our side. So I'm hoping if uh, once once Grant goes through his update, he will sort of concur with that, that we, we are pretty much there now. And hopefully we can get these accounts signed off. Right, external audit report on this then. Contribution on this. Um, right, thank you, Chair. Um, I should be joined by Mary, hopefully on the screen as well, um, the audit manager. Um, we did table a, a progress report. It was late in the day, so I will just quickly talk through it, but not. Um, I will concur with both Cheryl and Ben that we think we are in the closing processes or closing process of finishing both the 2021 and the 21 22 um, audits. Um, 2021 was held open primarily because of infrastructure, because we didn't know what the, the impact of that would be. Following, I mean, we rehearsed the reason why it was delayed, sort of finishing it in the first place, but then infrastructure came in. So I suppose in, in terms of 21 22, we have been working through um, the infrastructure or the national infrastructure issue and the impact on this council. Um, and, we, and as both Ben and Cheryl have said, we've worked quite closely with the finance team now that the statute instrument and the for guidance has come out. Um, we've had to go through that process because the way we're, it, you put it in your financial statements, we were sort of comfortable with that. But again, um, I think the phrasing that is, is used quite a lot now is information deficit um, in terms of when we start digging on that, can we get the audit evidence to underpin some of those figures? Because um, there was a point where we got we were getting quite close to maybe you didn't have to apply the statutory override. Um, but when we had a look at that, you're consistent with a lot of councils is you have a lot of information, but we couldn't necessarily guarantee all the information being there uh, in the format that we'd need as auditors uh, and that our regulator would expect. So we've been working with you um, and I think we're now comfortable to where you're proposing to put the, the figures into financial statements. So we are going through just tidying that up. Um, the one area we're looking at at the moment is um, around infrastructure and highways is getting in contact with your highways experts. Um, just to find, just to be clear about some of the asset lives. That's just an audit process we have to go through. Um, but they have been prioritising work elsewhere. You've had flooding and issues around here in, in, in the in the county. So um, we're quite understanding getting a hold of those people. Um, uh, and it's also to reflect the conversations we had earlier around capacity of, of some teams to to easily respond to audit queries. So that that is in process uh, progress, and hopefully we'll be able to to finalise that shortly. Um, we're still awaiting, I think, the final piece of evidence around pension or pay referred to, which uh, in the Council IS-19 report, but again, that's a, hopefully a fairly straightforward piece. The one area where we're still looking through with, with both uh, Cheryl, well, my friend with Cheryl, is um, you did employ a new valuer um, for 21-22. They've taken a slightly different approach to when they measure some of the, uh, the sort of footprints of assets around treatment of void areas. Um, and I suppose this is where it's sort of, if it happened in 21-22, we wouldn't have a Concern, but because 2021's open, we have to now ask you to say, well, is there an impact on 2021 um, and in relation to, and we use IS8 there, which is around this prior period adjustment. So I think we're just going through that process, hopefully with the council to, to get to the point that actually there wouldn't have been a material impact on the prior year, so we can move forward. And that's a bit of work that we are we are currently working upon. So I suppose those are the three main areas um, as we've been through account, we've through all equity, mainly around property, plant and equipment, which is, seems to be the main focus of our audit at the moment. Um, and hopefully we're moving on from that. We'd be interested to see what the Treasury thematic uh, report says at the end of coming out of that. So, so those are the three main areas. And we are, as, as we're saying, progressing those. I'd be hopeful, I'd say, probably the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to finalise everything um, uh, and, and bring those audits to a, to a conclusion. Our report does say that the basic things we need to go through, i.e. we sort of received statements about the same time as you have, so we're going through the checking the financial statements as well. Um, and then we just need to do as final things like updating post balance sheet events, getting the letter of representation signed. So um, that's sort of where we are on the audit. In our progress report, what we have done in a way is just on the, the last two pages. You've had audit findings reports from us. You will get a finalised audit findings report that brings everything together. For, for your information but what we try to do here on those two pages is say well what's changed from what you've heard already so if you if you look at those on those ones around um again we're going through the group accounts you close down quite rightly your accounts on estimated figures the group accounts are now a bit audited and finalized there's some changes within the actual accounts which you consolidate we just need to work out what those differences are whether they would affect the accounts 
And then there's some recommendations that we've, we've put in around um, some work on the group accounts around the way you work with SBFC Energy um, and their purchasing arrangements. So it's just really understanding what they are um, and, and you being, I suppose, in a sense, understanding what risks you are exposed to through the purchasing arrangement and what you need to disclose in the financial statements. Um, I so said we picked up on the value of change, um, and a lot of that around is documenting how you challenge that. Whilst you have an expert, they're still your account, so it's really what. And actually, you probably do do a lot of challenge with your with your valuer and saying, well, how have you reached that conclusion? Um, it's really writing that down and showing that you've spoken to them and not just that oh, here's a report we've taken at face value. It's not saying you don't do it, but if it's not evidence that you've done it, then that's part of our challenge back uh, around that. Um, one area around Shrewsbury Sports Village is due to the change in value, where uh, um, the actual footprint of that has moved year on year, 2021 into 21 22. Um, and again, I think the, the estimate is just there's a difference maybe on valuation of around a million pounds. So I don't think that's going to be material. And it's primarily because just the, the way that the new value was taken into account, I think some of the, sport, the, the, the sports grounds around the building rather than the building itself. I think the building's fine. Um, again, it's not material, but um, it, it could be because it goes back. If 2021 is closed, you just say change it to 21, 22, but because 2021 is open, we're asking the council to think about, well, does it impact 2021? I think my suspicion on that one is it's not material, so you say we won't adjust for it and we'll pick it up in 21, 22. Um, and I think there's some other elements around the sort of population that we've, we've done some testing um, for transactions um, that are outside of the, the accounting period. Again, they are they're relatively small, um, but one, yeah, I think it's really like they've got one large item, which is trivial. So we're not going to take that forward. But I think it's just really maybe tightening up some of those year-end accrual processes around PPE. Um, and I mean, we had a conversation earlier today around PFI. There's some disclosure improvements around uh, the PFI liabilities. So um, overall, those are what's changed. So I think there's anything significant coming out of that. It's the PPE issues, and once we bottom those, we should be in a position to to finalise the statement of accounts audits and move on um, uh, around that. I don't know if anything else you particularly want to add into that. So. Thanks, Grant. Now, I, th I think you've covered everything. As, as Grant said, our, our key piece of work is the infrastructure uh, and ultimately it's testing your depreciation charge within the accounts, which is is linked to your useful lives. Um, there will be some challenges to your expert. Obviously, Grant's touched on on flooding, for example, within, within Shropshire. Just to understand really that challenge point, how has that, for example, been built into your, your useful lives? And and obviously that is where the, the your highways expert really does uh, come into play in, in this point. So that's our main piece of ongoing work, which we're looking to tie off very, very soon. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I'm most grateful to Grant for uh, sensibly putting items 16 and 17 together, uh, which it was a very useful thing to do. Uh, Roger. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm just asking to so, confirm that we're doing 16 and 17 together. Yes, I've got, I'll, I'll I've take questions of question. Question. Yeah, I've got a little bit of a question. I've got two, two questions, if I can. I'll go to 17 first, and that is that uh, on page four of the report, the last few words and it's assurance from our staff, I suppose, uh, recommendation regarding this point, as it will aid the council, especially should individuals leave. Uh, I presume that has already been taken account of, and that will be recommendation followed up fairly rapidly, because if I read into that, there is something there which we need to ensure that that knowledge is retained within the council and available. And then uh, on the uh, statement of accounts, I picked up about West Mercia Energy, and I was going to raise that as well, because as I understand it, West Mer uh, the contract that Shropshire Council and West Mercia Energy had was to buy energy uh, on long term, and that contract has now just been renewed, and the cost of energy has now been, another contract has been let for some time. So we're not buying it on the open market. There is a long-term contract in place. And I read where some other local authorities, their energy companies have 
had great, great problems and caused problems for uh, the pair and council. But I presume we aren't covered by that because we're letting separate energies and using separate contracts and West Mercia Energy have got something in place to uh, both uh, supply the power to Shropshire Council, to schools and some of the parish councils who have also signed up to it. Yeah. So, do you want to call on that point? Yes, let's deal with the second point first. And okay. then I'll yeah. ask Roger to uh, briefly restate his first point so we understand where we're going. Yeah, it's, uh, second point first. Let James respond yeah. okay. about the energy. Okay, so so um, briefly in terms of West Mercer Energy, um, so this is a joint committee owned by um, four local authorities, OS, um, Telford Region, Herefordshire and Worcestershire, um, and they have about 13, I think it is at the moment, maybe more, uh, external clients. Um, they have uh, long-term uh, arrangements with a electricity and a gas uh, provider, and those get renewed on the open market every four to five years. Um, so they're procured uh, on that basis. That arrangement with that uh, supplier, um, what happens is, is that the uh, Westminster Energy, based on a set, an assessment of volumes for all of their customers, they then buy uh, that energy and gas on the market. Um, and because of the way that the procurement works, they are able to buy it um, and release um, money back into the uh, release um, you know, uh, uh, purchases back into the market or buy more, depending on where the market sits at that particular point in time. So we have the advantage that much of the 21, 22, 22, 23 um, uh, electricity, which saw the, the huge spike, had already been pre-purchased before this, the, the increases went up. Um, obviously, you can't keep buying ahead. There comes a period where you haven't bought ahead um, as time catches on. And so that, that graph uh, steepens up and you're buying electricity and gas at a higher at a higher level. Um, but what you can do is, is you don't need to buy all of it at that point, you don't have a fixed a fixed contract. So you can buy maybe 10% or 20% or 30% uh, and you can see how the market changes and then decide whether to lock out or, or, or remove on that basis. Where we have external clients, um, some of those wish to buy in on uh, fixed term contracts. Um, so they're at the mercy of the market at that point in time. Uh, also, the way that it's managed for the owners and the way it's managed for the uh, external clients, uh, there are different baskets that are purchased. So depending on when somebody signs up to their contract, somebody who's coming in now will be coming in at the top of the market, others will be coming in uh, at, at lower levels. So all of that is used to manage the way in which we um, uh, we procure the energy, um, the, the energy and gas within uh, within WME. Um, so we don't ever see a spike. Uh, but we will see those increases coming through over a period of time um, if the market is higher. We can't avoid that. We have to buy that that gas electricity at that point in time. Three main contracts. We've got all of the admin uh, buildings. We've got schools and street lighting. They're the three main contracts that we have, and all of those have different arrangements. Thank you. I'll come back to you on your first point, Roger, in a minute. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the statement of accounts? Yes. Um, this may be a bit technical, but it, it is the change which, we, which we've um, uh, been shown. Uh, and there's a couple of, uh, of um, uh, reductions in value, which I presume just goes to the reserve related to the PFI contracts. Um, it's on page uh, four and five million, four. Um, 16 million, 12, 12 million. Uh, I don't want to dwell into the whole accounting side of it, but but what's gone on there? Because the, the previous ones in you know, a year in 21, I'd have thought have been sort of signed off, um, and, and yet we've got a reduction of 16 million. The, the 21? Maybe I'm, I'm 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 value. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not asked like, Mary to come in, but I mean, basically, this was, I mean, part of the, let's go back some time. Well, when we looked at 20, no, no, it's, 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 it's the, when we, the council, you know, I, I mean, if I get this correct, it, it's similar. A lot of these changes are simply when we were looking for evidence of, I suppose, the, a lot of valuations are based upon the footprint of whatever you've, you've got in place. So I suppose what the bigger one there is, is looking around um, when we looked at the evidence of underpinning the valuation and said, well, can you show us or demonstrate to us the area that the value was taken into account? 
that information wasn't readily available, you've had to go through a process of getting, or it would have gone back to, to, to uh, we're in the high water, we're in the various estate systems to look at the plans and re like remeasure them. And it just came, came out that actually some of these areas were wrong. So that correction basically is actually saying. Oh, so that's infrastructure, is it? Yeah, so the, well, that's actually, well, the way the PFI, so I'm saying so, but is there are assets that are linked to the PFI oh, and, they, and they are valued independently on the way of a contract. Oh, oh. So, so they're subject to the same valuation basis as anything else. We were looking at the underlying evidence. So that big, that change there, the big 12 million, I suppose, one is around to actually the floor areas and look right, you need to change it. It can get more complicated on PFI because within the contract itself, it assumes capital spend, et cetera, on certain points in time. If that doesn't happen, but in simplistic terms, you have a unitary payment for PFI that doesn't change. Um, but the valuation sometimes can, can move around the liabilities depending on when that capital spend happens. But okay. basically, the assets are valued as in line with any other asset. So it, it will be infrastructure generally, you think it would be that. So, but it was when you look at it, we said, well, where's the floor area? Can we measure it correctly? It came to light that actually there was an error there. I think that's, uh, um, I would look to Mary, I know she painstakingly looked at this in detail. So that was the, uh, I think that's that. I I did, yeah. Um, I was just wanted to, if I could just clarify the question, was it around the fair value disclosure within yes. the the PFI notes? Okay. Um, it's the reduction just... I'm concerned about. Right. Okay. So, so the fair value disclosure is 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 a disclosure point only. Um, it's in relation to the disclosures you need to make around financial instruments. So the, that's not a value which appears in your balance sheet. As no, such. I do understand. Is... I, I but, understand. Right, okay. The concept of fair value it's it's just you've reduced it that's what i'm but, how, okay we no, the, we raised a, a, a query point with the council they use uh, an external expert to provide those fair values that expert uh, the report we'd seen used a premature repayment rate which isn't in accordance with ifs 13 the council we re, re, uh, received a revised report based on current rates and that is the the revised value um that is subject to to our review obviously okay no that's brilliant answer <laughs> that's, okay. that's all i mean sorry <laughs> to labor that everybody no, uh, thank you very okay. much i'll be quiet i answered the wrong questions wasn't you it? did never mind we're dealing with this very happily but first of all to dispose of this particular report the five mistakes that count there are three recommendations on page two of the report, which I don't propose to read out, which suddenly move that we accept these recommendations. Moved by Simon, seconded by Nigel, and agreed, I take it. Right. We've now disposed uh, of the statement of accounts. I'm going to go back to Roger for his first point that he made, and he will make it again, remind us briefly of it. Uh, which is on the audit findings report. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, grateful for this, and it is on the audit findings, and it's um, on page four of it, I think, the last part of it, which is the property, plant and equipment. Uh, I noted advanced, advanced notice of a recommendation that the audit are going to, are expected to make, and it's about the individual's knowledge and retaining that knowledge within the council. And I think they just raised that. And I'm just raising it now that uh, that is being taken care of now, rather than waiting until the final report from the Grand Thornton appears. So I think that's the basic of my question. Yeah, that's right. Just go, I'm, well, I'm not expecting anyone to leave. There's a sort of, I suppose there's a basic audit commentary well, around. Yeah. It's sort of like, um, it kind of got to the point of maze around um, where you even where you employ experts is um, it is taking that owner's ownership and responsibility to challenge them appropriately, even if they are your experts, and to understand as best you can what what information they're giving you. So uh, that comment there really is when you get the we and we, we this happens is sort of we know officers look at the valuation report and then they form their own views about does that make sense to me? Do I understand it? Um, we would come in and say, well, did you challenge your value or did you challenge your expert? Um, and they said yes, but there's no evidence of it. So whether it's an email or whatever, if there's, you know, we're just saying write down what you looked at when you got the valuation report, what questions you had, and how you challenged the value back to be satisfied that you believe the valuer has done what you expected them to do. So 
um, or even document that you've gone through the report and you're comfortable with it. Uh, it yeah, it's just evidence that you haven't just taken the report, to be honest, and put the numbers into the accounts and gone, it must be right. Um, as you can see, um, just from our, some of our fines reports, sometimes I'm not expecting you to know whether they use the right interest rate per se necessarily, um, but you know, they've, they've applied an incorrect interest rate, they've applied the policy correctly. To a certain extent, that's what we're there for, to be that backstop, but it's understanding that what they put in the valuation report. So just write it down um, ahead of, and, and then, because we'll come in six or seven months, you know, or three, four months, actually, two months later now, hopefully. Um, and if any change in the department since then, being able to really find. So that's that's where that recommendation is coming from, not uh, around that. And I will say you're not alone in that. We've been met having this conversation with all clients around being able to demonstrate challenge and effectiveness and ownerships. Thank you. <clears throat> Shall we agree to receive the thanks the report of our external auditors on all the progress report and sector updates. Agree? Thank you. Uh, item 18, is the date and time of next meeting of the 26th, 2nd of June is set out there. Item 19 <coughs> is the exclusion of press and the public. Um, to resolve that in accordance with the provision of section 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, Section 5 of the Local Authorities uh, Regulations and paragraphs 2, 3 and 7 of the Council's Access to Information Rules, the public and press be excluded during consideration of the following items. Agreed? You've got him well trained, <laughs> Julia. You've got him well trained. <laughs> um, right. 